All right, I think we're rolling. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the calendar year end meeting for redesign. I'm just going to go ahead and start out on the wiki like I usually do just to show you where all of the um, documentation for uh, the year end meeting is. So if we scroll down and I'm going to the SSDT meetings and trainings page. And over on the side here, we have the documentation for redesign. So under the calendar year end um, section, we have an agenda for the meeting up here. That recorded webinar is going to be linked to this page. And then um, for USAS and USPS, we have the presentations and um, some supporting documentation and the checklist out here. The presentation is in a, um, a PowerPoint format so that you can download and modify that for your districts if you want. Um, the checklist, I have that pulled up here. That is through um, a wiki page. Oops, I'm getting some feedback. If you are not muted, please mute yourself. Thanks so much. Um, so once um, you get to this page, yeah, the checklist is on the wiki. Um, this can be downloaded to PDF or if you want to get it in a Word document, um, you can pull that right off of here. For USAS, there are um, a few changes this year, especially to this pre-closing procedures section. So um, you definitely want to check that out. Maybe need to revamp that if you did um, have a ITC specific checklist last year. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the USAS presentation. Um, I'll be doing that section. And then once we finish up USAS, Lori is going to take over and do the payroll side. Um, so to get started here with the USAS procedures, the first thing is just to kind of lay out what we're going to talk about. Um, this first section, verifying the 1099 data, that is the section um, that can be done as part of the pre-closing, um, taking a look at which vendors qualify for 1099 and that sort of thing. We'll talk about the month end close a little bit. Some additional things for um, some additional items for the calendar year in close and then the 1099 procedures and the TR 1099 program. First section, um, verifying the 1099 data. So when they go in and they look at their vendors, um, they're going to want to verify which vendors are going to receive 1099s and then the data relevant um, that's going to show on the 1099s. So which vendors, what's their 1099 type, are they, you know, um, is it non-employee compensation, is it uh, royalties, that sort of thing. The taxable amount that will show as the total on the 1099 the tax ID number and the type of that. So is that um, an EIN or is it their social security number? And then the 1099 name and address. Now I'm going to talk about a couple different ways that they can review this information. Um, so if you been to my trainings before, you know I commonly say that there are always, there's generally more than one way to do anything in redesign. So I wanted to show these different ways to look at things, but also um, put it in the context of, you know, when is it good to use the vendor grid versus the report or, you know, what's, what am I going to use which one of the two reports? And you know what? Let me see. Um, so I did add notes 
it's in this PowerPoint presentation too. So if you download this, I tried to add a couple of things that, um, you know, obviously I'm going to talk about today, but that may be helpful in um, talking to your districts too. So just as we are going to talk about each one of these options, but just as kind of like a highlight view, the vendor grid, that's going to be convenient when you're updating information. So you're hands on in the grid. Um, you actually need to go in and view the records. The 1099 template report, that is the one that's going to be in the report manager. So that's their year round for them to use. They can check in on that one. Um, so that's going to be helpful for that situation. And then the 1099 extract report is the one that actually comes from the 1099 extract program. So that is their like final verification when they're actually at year end creating the tape file. And because um, some of this stuff with redesign, you know, we are a couple years in now, we have a lot more districts on this year. Um, I want to be hands on with some of this. So I'm going to review these grids, but I am actually going to hop into the software today as well to um, show some examples of these next couple. Um, when we're talking about the vendors grid, you can use that vendors grid to review the tax ID type for 1099 vendors. Um, and here's an example. This comes up a lot. Uh, throughout the year when we're talking about, you know, different things that you can do. It's a really good example that we've used in the past for um, how to use those filters. So let me get my page up here. And I'm going to go ahead and head right to the vendor grid. I wanted to reset my columns so we could look at adding those, but I don't think I did that. So we're going to do that real quick too. Just so we can kind of start with the standard view of, um, you know, what a user would see even if they've added their own custom um, columns, they would have that on there. But um, there are some, when they're at, um, when they're specifically looking at this uh, 1099 data that they may want to add to their grid. So there was an update that um, came out recently with that more option where you can go add your columns and then it's going to refresh the page so that you don't have to do it manually. So it is recommended at this point, add your columns and then add your filters in. So we are going to do that. Um, I can come down here. There's a little section for 1099 information. And I can add my type, my 1099 type on there. These are my tax ID fields that I want to review. And then if I did want to add additional things, like say I wanted to add some of the 1099 address information to my grid, I could do that as well. I'm not going to do that right now. Um, but I do want to add the amounts. So the year to date taxable total is what is used for the 1099s. Uh, I could add the normal total too if I wanted to compare, but that taxable total is really what I um, care about in regards to this. And when I close the more option, that's going to update my grid to add those things on for me. So now that I'm in here, I can add some filters to say, all right, I want it to be an active vendor. I want everything except for ones that don't get a 1099, so I want anybody that does get a 1099, and I can do that um, by doing the greater than, less than sign, or less than, greater than, and then um, typing in non-1099. And so now it's going to um, filter that out. It's going to exclude that and give me everything else here. And for my total, I can do um, like a greater than or equals 600, and that's going to filter down my grid. Um, again, this is really convenient when they're actually going through these records. Um, when, they, when the 1099s are generated, they have to have that tax ID type on there. Um, because that's what they have, you know, filed with the IRS as their ID. So each one of these records has to have something entered in these columns. Um, I'm in a test database, so none of them have it, so that would be a big problem. 
Um, but generally, they will have information in these columns. And using this grid, they could quickly scroll through and say, you know, oh, this one has a gap. They can come in here to edit the record, add the ID, and add the ID type, and then go back to their grid and, you know, scroll through and see the next one. And so if they do need to add that information, that's right here under the 1099 information. Um, they'll also, you know, they may want to review this 1099 type. So um, that's right in that same section as well. So if they needed to update this to a different type, they could just switch it there. Um, so I do have those different options on this PowerPoint so that you can refer to that um, later, you know, if you are going to be showing that or, um, you know, once your districts get in there, this has listed what they would need to enter in. The other option that can be used on this same grid, um, basically instead of just manually putting in those filters, is that they could use the advanced query. Now, this is going to do the same exact thing, um, but the advantage of the advanced query is that they could save their query. So instead of having to remember what they type in every time they want to look at it, they could type it in once and then save that query and then just come up here and load that. So um, if I say, you know, I want active and my 1099 type and my year to date total. Um, the other advantage with this one before I get too far is, you know, if I didn't want to have some of these things on my grid, I wouldn't have to. Um, in this one, I think it's kind of nice if they're reviewing the information to have it all right there in the grid. But once you're using the advanced query, you know, you could have it in the query instead of on the grid. So their grid could be a little bit cleaner. Um, so we're going to do act, active equals true. The 1099 type, I want this to not equal non-1099. And then our year-to-date taxable total is going to be greater than or equal to 600. And once I have the information that I want in that query, I can just apply it. And that's going to go ahead and um, update my grid at the bottom there. So it went ahead and sorted it for me, uh, or filtered it for me, rather. Um, if I want to save it, and see, I was in here before, so I can just go ahead, type in whatever I want for a name, and then save this. Once I saved this, the next time I come in here, I could just open this advanced query, select this, hit apply, and I wouldn't have to, you know, build all of these filters every time. Um, so if it's something that they may be reviewing throughout the year, you know, or they know that they're going to come back and, and check in on again, or um, maybe if they just want to build that this year so that they have it there next year, um, that's just another option. The other thing that they can do on this grid is kind of reverse these filters and take a look at vendors that have a year-to-date amount that would qualify for a 1099, but are, who are not going to get a 1099. So if I change this, say I change that to equals, go ahead and apply my query. Now, this, these people, you know, may not need to get a 1099. The purpose of this is for them to be able to review and see if maybe um, there is, um, you know, somebody who is incorrectly marked. You know, this, oh, this development, you know, this is actually um, non-employee compensation. I had them marked as non-1099. So you can go into their record, add the 1099 information here, um, add their ID and a type. And so just kind of like a quick review that they can do to um, 
and see if anybody sticks out. I, the name of the classic report is slipping my mind right now, but there is one, you know, similar option in classic when they run those reports where they can view uh, vendors that, you know, have the year to date amount, but don't get the 1099. So similar idea to that. And they can do that on the grid too. They just um, basically filter by non 1099 instead of putting the little not equals um, symbol in there. Of course, with the grid, there are some other um, things that they can do, some other advantages. I showed um, how they can add the 1099 location, name and address to that grid. So if they want to review all of that information at once, they can absolutely um, do that from the grid. They can also, um, once they have this pulled up, they have the report option here. So they could definitely generate a PDF report right from what they have pulled up here. They could, you know, save this as a report definition, um, and then that would save and be in their report manager so they could run it later. So if they've really customized those columns as per what they want to see, that is an option. Uh, the 1099 locations, um, I wanted to make sure I touch on these. At the bottom of uh, that vendor information screen, so when they open the vendor to edit or view, there is this section for locations at the bottom. And the location that has the check mark for 1099 is going to be the address um, and name that is used uh, when the 1099 is generated. So when they add that to the grid, that's what it's looking for um, from that default 1099 location section is which address is marked as 1099. When the district's uh, data was imported from Classic, uh, in Classic, you know, they had this, they could put the second name, uh, 1099 colon, and then put their second name, and it would use that name instead. So for any vendors that had that in Classic, when uh, their data was imported to redesign, it did recognize that 1099 name and create a 1099 location that used that name. So that would be set up um, when it came over. I would still recommend, I mean, if this is their first year uh, doing their 1099s, you know, it's definitely good to review all of those addresses, make sure everything came over appropriately, um, you know, in case there were miss keys or anything like that, but um, in general, that will be um, set to go for them. So the next way that they can review information is with this 1099 vendor report. This report um, is in the reports manager. Now, Right now, it uses a primary name and address instead of having that 1099 name and address on it. So uh, we have an update coming that's going to change that, which will make that report a bit more useful um, for reviewing this information. But in the checklist, there is an updated report definition that includes the 1099 name and address. Um, so in the future, this will definitely be a report that they can check throughout the year. Uh, right now, if your districts want to use this or if you want to recommend that they are using it for year end, um, I would say go get that updated report definition first uh, just to make sure that they are able to review uh, the actual address information that will be on the 1099. Next is the 1099 extract report. So this report is found if you actually go to the periodic menu, go to the 1099 extract program, um, the same place that they would generate the tape file, and then at the very bottom of this one is an option that says print report. 
This report is basically used to verify the data prior to creating the tape file. Um, I see this as the one that they would be doing, you know, in their actual calendar year end closing piece. Um, instead of like the pre-closing, where they want to verify exactly what's going to be on that tape file. Um, it does subtotal by the 1099 type, and um, it also defaults to exclude vendors with no tax ID. So I feel like this is notable. Um, I mean, as part of that pre-closing, districts want to be making sure that those ID numbers are, you know, all entered in. Um, for their 1099 vendors, but if they do miss one, this is a report that they could compare to the prior total that they expected, and if that's different, it could be that it, that a vendor, um, you know, that they expected to get a 1099 does not have that ID in, and it would filter them out. So something to uh, keep an eye on. And because this report is part of the program that actually generates the extract file, um, this entire program cannot be run until the posting period for December of the calendar year has been created. So if they were to go in right now, they haven't created the December posting period yet and tried to print this report, they would get an error. And that's just because they wouldn't be generating the extract file at this point yet. Um, so that is why that other report, you know, kind of exists. It gives them an option that they will have outside of um, actually, you know, going to the extract report. Um, if they do want to look at this report, December, the posting period for December just has to be created. It doesn't have to be open or current, um, but it does have to be created. Then when they are reviewing um, their vendor information, so we've talked about um, updating the ID number, we've talked about updating address information, uh, 1099 type. These vendor adjustments come in handy if you need to make an adjustment to the year-to-date amount. And this could be for things like adding royalties or um, there is a specific situation if you have um, go through the process to like quote void a check from a prior fiscal year but it was within this calendar year um, or maybe you're combining two vendor records that should have been one so they go in and view the vendor this vendor adjustments um, option pops up um, when you are in that view That'll give you another pop-up. You can create the adjustment um, by clicking create. It has a nice little grid that would show you any other adjustments that were entered. And um, you would enter in the date. You can put a description on it. There is a taxable checkbox. I believe that defaults to being checked. Uh, if, if this is for 1099 figures, you definitely want to leave that checked and then the amount can be entered as positive to increase that year-to-date, or it can be entered as a negative adjustment if you need to decrease that year-to-date. All right, so this is the last um, slide for this first section on uh, verifying the 10, 1099 information. Um, before we move on to the month end closing, does anybody have any questions about um, anything covered there? Amanda? Yes. Uh, do you, if you don't check the taxable, what happens? It is will only update the year-to-date total. So there's three totals, like fiscal year to date, taxable year to date, and just a regular year to date? Uh, no, the regular, so, well, perhaps, yeah. Um, see, it's right, this section right here. So we have okay. fiscal year to date totals and then the calendar. So if I, oh wait, okay, so if I leave taxable checked, it will update both. 
If okay. I uncheck taxable, it will only update this one. Okay. Okay. Right, thank you. No problem. Anyone else? Okay. And um, those steps, so this whole first section here um, kind of covers all of those steps. We'll get back to that 1099 extract report. So that's probably the only part that is not um, in this first section from what we've talked about already. But it has some notes in here um, that give them those options that we talked about for filtering the grid and that sort of thing. All right, so for the month end closing, um, this is pretty similar to the regular month end closing here, um, kind of the basics. So they're going to go ahead when they're ready, proceed with closing out their month of December as normal. They would enter their transactions for the current month, um, reconcile USAS with their bank records. So they have that bank reconciliation procedure, um, and there's a link in the checklist for that. Um, and then basically ensuring that they balance, so running their cash summary, comparing that to a financial detail, and ensuring that those totals match. Once they are all set and balanced, um, they can proceed to their next steps. There are some optional, uh, well, there's an optional step here with running the spending plan summary report. And then um, at this point, here's our change for this month end section. Um, they can manually run any desired month end reports that they want. Um, and we've got a list on the next page that's kind of that standard list. If there are other reports that they run um, during their balancing process, you know, this basically is just a reminder for that. If there are specific things um, that they might, you know, want to generate, uh, that they save or um, that sort of thing. But outside of what they want to manually run, the monthly CD report bundle is now available and it will automatically run when the posting period is closed. So when we get to calendar year end, um, we're going to touch back on this because when we actually close that period um, is when it's going to happen. At calendar year end, we have a couple more steps we'll talk about first. But um, this is going to happen at the end of November as well. So once they go into core posting periods and actually close uh, that posting period, it's going to generate 24 SSDT template reports. Um, a list of those are out on the wiki. And then it will put that into the, their file archive so that they can view it later. So here's the standard list that, you know, that's been with this month end checklist. Um, they can manually run any or all of these if they want, but they don't necessarily have to if it's just for um, saving that copy, you know, if they were doing that in place of monthly CD. And then for the calendar year end closing, so we're still kind of talking about generating additional reports at this point. Um, at calendar year end, I mean, really outside of the norm, the 1099s are the big thing for USAS. Um, but I know that sometimes districts are looking for a workers' compensation report. And there is an option that you can use to help generate a worksheet for this within um, redesign. So the ProRation Utility Program generates a spreadsheet um, that can be used to calculate the premium for workers' comp payments. Um, to use this, you do want to create an account filter first that would include your workers' comp amount. So if that's, you know, if they just need like the salary accounts, they might filter it to just be the object code starting with one. And here's where I'm going to hop out of this presentation again, and we're going to take a look at this. So the proration utility is over here under utilities. And when they get here, this page looks pretty simple. 
Um, they'd select a time period. So right now we are at calendar. We want those calendar year to date figures, but they could um, use month to date or fiscal to date. You know, if they're trying to use this um, at other times of the year, this absolutely can probably be used for more than just workers comp. Um, so we're just kind of, we're using that as uh, the example right now because that's what we uh, may need it for. Uh, but this definitely is a flexible program. The account filters, I built one in, in advance that would just show my expenditure accounts and um, that have the object code starting with one, like that example. And I called it work comp, so I just picked my account filter. File name, this is the name I'm going to give it. And then I click create. And what it did there is it went out, pulled all of those accounts that match my filter, brought in a calendar, uh, calendar year to date amount, and then figured out, you know, what percentage of the total each, um, you know, amount is. So if we want to spread an amount over these accounts, it can help us calculate how that should be done. Um, there are a couple different ways to use this. Uh, I think it depends if the district's using it for workers' comp, it depends on, you know, are they at the stage where they're trying to estimate the work comp figure or do they actually have their total at year end that they're now trying to charge? Because um, I think sometimes they like do estimates throughout the year. Some people use, you know, payroll deductions to do it or they'll make manual postings. Um, so we'll do two different kind of examples here. And the first one is, if it's calendar year end, I have my total workers' comp amount that I need to charge to these accounts, you know, to spread out appropriately. And I know that my total for workers' comp is $10,000 or, yeah, we'll say $10,000. So I'm going to come to column B and type that in, whatever that total is. And then it's going to split this amount through this column so that I know how much, you know, would be allocated to each account. And so I know scrolling is kind of rough on this WebEx, but I just want to get to the bottom here. So when I look at this very last line, so this is the total calendar year to date of everything in, um, you know, all of the charges to these accounts. And then at the end of column E, so that's the total that I said I wanted to charge to those accounts. This column tells me how much to each. Now, the other thing that I've seen is, you know, if they're trying to use this throughout the year, they might just get like a rate from workers comp and then, um, like I've seen before, you know, a report where you just plug in that rate and it kind of spreads it out over the, um, it'll calculate for, you know, each account. So if I wanted to do that, I would do this a bit differently. Um, so that's going to be our second example here. I can download this and it's going to take this worksheet right to Excel for me. And once I'm in Excel, I have a bit more flexibility. I can use whatever, you know, formulas I want. So um, say that my workers' comp percentage is 0.25%. Um, Usually there's something, you know, really low like that. Um, what I'm going to do is scroll all the way down again. <laughs> Sorry about that. And grab the entire total. And if I know that the amount I want prorated is going to be, oh, you know what? I forgot I have to write this down. I'm sure there's a way to paste it in there, but when we're, when we're live on the air, <laughs> I'm just going to write this down because sometimes Excel likes to pull tricks. So, um, if I go ahead, put in my total here, and then multiply it 
by my rate, so um, because it's 0.25%, I'm going to add a couple more zeros here. Um, and then what that'll do, so this box ends up calculating my percentage total, and then that can be spread over the accounts. And so each of these will end up equaling, you know, to that, and that would be the total that ends up being charged. So kind of um, an interesting program there, uh, at least a way to um, be able to help get those amounts. And again, I'm sure that can be used for other things throughout the year, so um, keep that in mind as well. Their next step here is under the periodic menu, they are going to run that 1099 extract program. We saw this view uh, before when we talked about the report. Um, but when they do run it, they're going to select 2019 as the payment year. There are two different options for this output file. So the XML is what's going to be used when printing the 1099s. So they'll want to generate that file. And then the IRS format is what um, is used to actually create the tape files for the IRS submission. They should review the file name, tax ID uh, for the district, the address, and contact information. And then they would click uh, generate extract file to generate, um, you know, whichever one of the output files they have selected. And then print report will get them that report. So again, that's a good one to use when they're actually generating it. They can go ahead, generate the tape, generate the report, print that out and know that they have a record that matches what they generated to submit or to print. And so just to flip back here, um, that output file is controlled by this little drop down. The payment year is down here, and then they should be verifying all of the information that um, shows in these boxes, and that's the organization information. Once they've done that, um, they're pretty much ready to uh, wrap it up. The district would notify their ITC that that XML is ready to be printed. Um, I'm sure each ITC may have a different process for how they're going to, uh, you know, whether they're going to secure transfer that file or how that's going to work. So uh, we'll talk about an example of that a little bit later uh, when we get to those 1099 procedures. Um, but, you know, whatever your process is, the district would notify you basically that they are set and ready to close. Once they're ready to actually close the month, switch over to their new year, um, they would go to core, click on posting periods. They can create the new posting period for January. Check mark the current box to make that the new posting period uh, or to make that the new posting period, the current posting period, sorry. And then when they click on that folder to close December, um, A, it's closed, but B, that is exactly when it's going to start generating that monthly CD. And once they do that, they're closed um, for the month and the calendar year. So here's where I have some additional notes on the monthly CD. Um, we, you know, kind of talked about how this will automatically run when that posting period is closed. Um, but what it's going to do, it's going to run in the background. So it is a report bundle. Um, it'll go, you can see the status in the job scheduler. Once the reports start to appear in the file archive, you'll be able to see them there. Um, but it basically generates those 24 template reports sequentially. So it's going to run them back to back. Um, one thing to caution on with that is it's like you have another window open that's generating 24 reports. So 
when the district closes, this doesn't mean that they can't do anything else in the software, uh, but we do recommend that they would refa refrain from running other reports while the bundle completes or uh, jumping into like posting payables or, you know, some kind of heavy processing um, because they basically have to think about it like, you know, if I was running a financial detail over here, then I'm not going to go run a bunch more reports in other windows. It's, you know, it's kind of like that. So just something to be cautious of. Um, when they close, but they can see the status, um, you know, in those couple different places of where the report bundle is at. If you need to reopen a posting period, the monthly CD bundle does automatically close or does automatically run again when the period's closed. So, how it works, and I have some um, some monthly bundles in my test land here. So I have my file archive and then it's going to show any um, monthly CD bundles that I have for prior months that I closed. And when I click on one of these, I could just click right on the line to open this highlight view and I can see all of the reports that are included. Um, if I reopen a period and then I close it again, and I don't do anything to this previous bundle, what it's going to do is it's going to add a second set of reports within this same category because it's for the same month. So I can see, you know, the timestamp, but I would have, you know, two of each. So you don't want to do that. Um, to avoid that, I mean, may maybe there is a reason you want to, so you could. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, the way to prevent that, um, there's two options. So if you um, are reopening the period and you do not want um, the reports to generate when you reclose it, you want your original reports to stay out there, you could go to the report bundles and just disable your monthly CD reports, close that period, and then come back and re-enable it. So that would prevent it from running and adding an additional set of reports. The other option you have is um, in this file archive, you can delete these reports first. So if I want the new reports to be the only August reports, I would just delete this package. And then when I reclose August, it would make a new um, package out here. A new, um, it would put August back and uh, put that bundle together. Those are documented in the wiki as options. I know this was in uh, the release notes as well, but I just kind of wanted to, you know, talk that through and, and look at those options um, since that's going to be new for November as well. Um, the last thing that I want to make sure to say is this process um, when you close the month, it's going to generate this report, those reports. It should only be used for months going forward. Um, I feel like some districts may be tempted to, uh, you know, maybe go open their prior months and just close them so they can get those reports and have that all nice and clean out there. Um, I know that they've been waiting for this, so it is really exciting, but um, that is definitely not recommended to go back and like open and reclose prior months. There is a way that we are working on um, that will regenerate those reports for previously closed periods in the future, um, but basically, that part wasn't quite ready yet, but we wanted to make sure that people can start getting their bundles, their monthly CDs going forward um, for now. So uh, for that part, they'll just want to sit tight and um, they will be able to, you know, get any uh, bundles that they had between migrating from Classic to Redesign and now. Amanda, I've got a question. Yes. Yes, Rhonda from HCC, and what if a district has custom reports that they also want to include in their monthly CD? Can they add it to the SSDT bundle, or do they create a separate bundle? Great question. I actually did want to mention this, so thank you. Um, they, what they would do is they would um, add another bundle, and um, we are going to cover that in detail on the December 6th session. So I know that's a couple weeks out, um, but if you have something that you know you want to do in the meantime, you can put in a ticket to us. I'm happy to help you get that set up. 
Um, but they they basically can set up like their own additional, but they can set it to to run at the same time. It would still run, you know, when that period's closed. Thanks for that information. No problem. Yeah, you know, and I know that it's like it came out now. We're gonna have it for November, so um, I'm a little antsy for that December session too because I think that is gonna be a really um, fun one. So we can we'll do examples on that and um, talk about that then. Okay, so 1099 procedures are next. Um, does anybody else have questions on any of those pieces that we covered so far before we kind of jump into the 1099 piece? Hey Amanda, this is Bonnie from Access. I got a quick question. And I know it varies on the size of the district, but when you guys were running these monthly reports, how long did it take for the 24 to run? Um, I want to say that it was um, like maybe 30 minutes. Perfect. That's what I needed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's tough. And I mean, at least that gives them kind of an expectation. Um, and again, like they're not totally tied down during that time. But I wanted to mention that because I know that I know that, you know, there are people that are just like antsy to get it rolling after they, they close it. They're done. So shouldn't be too bad. Amanda, this is Rhonda again from HCC. Yes. Can the user do other procedures um, while that archive is running or could they log out while it's running and still have it generate? Yes, uh, they definitely could log out. You know, that's not going to stop it. Like they don't have to actually be in there because it's basically scheduling it like a job. Um, so once they kick it off, it's going to run in that job scheduler. It's not like yeah, like I guess I gave the example, you know, if they had it open in, in another tab, it isn't exactly like that, you know, where they couldn't navigate away from that tab. Um, it will definitely still run if they needed to log out. If they need to be in there, um, it's not like once they click it, they can't do anything, you know, they're down and out for half an hour. They can still navigate through the software. They can still, um, you know, potentially add records. Like, it's not going to stop them from doing anything, but if they do something that's heavy processing, like if they have a payables batch that they have queued up, I wouldn't recommend that, you know, they close their month and then immediately start to post those payables. You know, it's those processes that you kind of already know are heavy on, um, you know, on the memory, on uh, that processing. That's the kind of stuff I wouldn't recommend that they do right away. But they can absolutely still be in there. They're not locked out by any means. Okay, thanks. No problem. All right, so 1099 procedures. Um, this part we get pretty standard. Uh, the um, just a reminder here that a couple years ago the federal law changed and moved up that 1099 deadline. So um, for any 1099 submissions that include non-employee compensation, generally they all you know generally they do. Um, those are due by January 31st. Um, and generally you are submitting all of your districts together. So what we recommend is that, you know, if you electronically submit those on behalf of your districts, um, set your own deadline with them, you know, make sure they can uh, have those uh, files generated and fill out the proper paperwork and everything so that you have time to compile uh, all of the district files and get those submitted by that deadline. And then in the PowerPoint, we have kind of an example of 1099 procedures. Uh, this part of the presentation definitely gets more towards just like, you know, for ITC um, directed instead of something that you may include in like your district PowerPoint. But I just kind of wanted to uh, talk through, you know, what this might look like as an example. Um, so once the ITC is notified, you know, by the district that they've completed their 1099 extract. They may receive a secure email or um, if you guys do file transfer, however you have set up to receive their 1099 uh, XML and tape files. 
then the ITC would upload that XML file into the EDGE software to actually generate the 1099 form for printing. And so when you save the tape file uh, for the submission, that could be renamed to uh, perhaps reference the district, and then it would be transferred into the VMS software. So that would be the ASCII uh, file or transfer type, and it could be put into um, like an empty subdirectory, say, in VMS. After the 1099s are printed, um, they'll be run through an envelope sealer, and then um, each district, so like as an example, you know, when you, uh, when you give your districts the 1099s, the district would probably receive, uh, or could possibly receive like copies of each 1099, and then instructions on how to distribute those. And then um, just rolling right into this TR-1099 program. So this is for creating and transmitting the 1099 data to the IRS. Um, there is an option to create test submissions that was covered in um, the 1099. Um, I'm sorry, that was covered in the classic webinar. <laughs> and um, so those 1099 slides within there um, can be referenced as uh, basically the same, it's the same process. So just didn't want to um, be too repetitive on this one. So once you have um, all of the files for, you know, if you still have classic districts and then for your redesign districts, um, those are, copied over into VMS, so all of your tape files will be in VMS, and then you'll need to append those into one file. When you are creating your command, the classic files must be entered before the redesign files. So, and, and this is kind of why. Um, so this kind of gives the details, but basically, um, you know, the redesigned tape files could be larger. They could have a different length. So you may get this, um, and I thought I had, sorry, I was just looking, I thought I had an example of the actual error, but it does say it in here. Um, you may get an error that says invalid record size when appending the files. So if you do the classic ones first and then append your redesigned tape files um, afterwards, you can use this additional command to truncate. And then here's an example of that. And once you um, compile those two, I believe you do get a report. So um, you can check your file sizes along the way um, to ensure that everything gets appended appropriately and then check the uh, totals as well. Hey, Amanda. Yes. Uh, this is Michelle. Um, I know that um, I believe that uh, the developers are currently working on a way so they don't have to use that truncate command. I think that's going to be on the next release. Um, so I think they'll just, if you um, go back to that prior slide, I think the, uh, so I think up the appending is going to stay the same, but I don't believe that they're going to have to do this convert append truncate. Um, I think they're going to get that fixed so that there isn't a restriction on that size of the tape uh, of, of the 750 byte record. So I think that's going to be fixed on the next one. If that changes, we will let you guys know, but I believe we won't have to worry about this um, uh, when it's time to actually append your classic and redesign files. That is perfect. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, I missed yeah. that. So that's so, great news, though. They hey, just this is funny. About that, so. Go ahead. Um, real quick, then does it matter whether your classic goes first? You just said your classic files had to be compiled first, and then you add your redesigned files to them. Does that matter if this fix is coming through? 
I'm not sure about that yet, Bonnie. Um, and I know we have it on here that to recommend to put the classic files first. If that changes and it doesn't make a difference, we will let you guys know. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Amanda. All right, so then um, once they get to actually creating the transmittal file, they're going to run that TR-1099 program. When you get to that step, um, you'll be entering the appended file name, so um, that file that you created compiling all the districts together. You'll give it an output file name and then have to enter um, the additional details here as far as um, the transmitter's PIN number, name, so this is generally the ITC information, um, company name, a contact person, and then uh, it'll ask you for the type of file. So that would be the original file uh, the first time around, you know, and there are some options as far as, you know, if there are replacement or correction files created later, but for your general submission, you're picking original. The transmitter control code received from the IRS. And then um, approved for combined state federal filing program. And it'll ask you if it's a prior year. And you generally do not want to put P unless it is prior year data. Uh, for your standard calendar year in process, though, it will not be. Once you get that entered in, um, you are going to get the TR-1099 TXT. That's going to be a summary report. So we recommend uh, reviewing that and keeping it on file at your site. And you'll also get the output file uh, to submit to the IRS. So that is going to be the file that uh, you're going to upload into the fire system. So again, that file um, should be submitted electronically by January 31st of 2020. There are additional instructions on this in Part B of the IRS publication, uh, 1220 for electronic filing. And then here is the link to that fire system. And an additional reminder to keep a copy of the, transmit, uh, the transmittal file and report for your records. Um, when you're on that fire site as well, I mean, you go to do that submission. Um, you may want to take screenshots along the way. Uh, that helps just kind of track, you know, when everything is transmitted. Generally, this is a good thing to keep copies of everything for. And I do believe that they send you a confirmation email um, after the submission goes through. And um, that is about it for um, you know, our USAS side, I have some notes here for upcoming sessions uh, for Fridays with Fiscal. So we do have two coming up. That one that I mentioned on December 6th, that is going to be more information on the report bundles that replace uh, monthly CD and payroll CD. Um, we will also talk about scheduling additional reports on that. And then on December 13th, we're going to do a Fridays with Fiscal to talk about major highlights from releases um, that have been happening recently. So, and here's a registration link on this. Um, before I turn it over to payroll, though, do we have other questions on the ending part or anything else that was covered? Hi, Amanda. This is Carrie from LACA. Hello. Um, just two questions on the 1099 extract and the proration utility for workers' comp. Can those be generated later if ever needed? Or is this like a once and done, or you'd have to reopen a posting period to generate any of this again, or is this um, stuff be regenerated if they lose the file or anything, or no? So the 1099 extract can be regenerated for prior years. Um, so that one you can definitely go back. Now, if they needed to make a change 
like to some, you know, say like a vendor amount was incorrect. Um, if they're changing anything, they may need to, uh, that's related to a prior period, they may need to reopen. Uh, but generally, you know, they can regenerate this for prior years. Um, for the proration utility, when we come in here, because this one just really goes on calendar, month, or fiscal to date, that's going to be based on whatever your current period is. So if you needed to do it for like a prior calendar year, you'd probably have to change the current period so that it would know, you know, that's just going to be the only indication um, right now that would let it know which data you want to select. Okay, thank you. No problem. Hi, Amanda. Yeah. It's Roxanne. Do you know if any of the ITCs are allowing or having their districts send the IRS file, or if this is um, like every ITC is doing it on their behalf? Hmm. Um. I don't know specifically. Um, I think generally the ITCs would compile and send them. Um, my understanding is that anybody, you know, if people register for like an IRS uh, FIRE um, login, you know, I think they could potentially send them, but I don't know that anybody is doing that currently. Okay, thank you. No problem. Amanda. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, this is Deb at Maveka. The, uh, we've always uh, given our districts an option to run the 1099s from a backup. And so we take their backup from calendar year in, we put it in a test database, and they are able to process 1099s from there. Okay. Um, would, um, should we create like a test instance? for that, or would they just change their uh, current period, posting period, and go back to December? Hmm. I guess it depends on like, are you, are they making, if they had it in a second test database, like were they making changes to anything in it? Well, before usually they ran it's it? just they don't have time, okay. or um, they're waiting on a W-9. Uh, from okay. a payroll standpoint, you know, we have all of those um, disability things that they're waiting on from the insurance companies to know how much disability payment uh, they're waiting on. So it's more, it's, well, really, it's about 50-50 that, um, you know, we have uh, payroll also in a demo and uh, their USAS stuff. But it, I think it's mostly yeah. that uh, a, co a convenience for them rather than um, that they're wanting to change anything from the year end? Um, well, I think that, um, I think that it really depends on what they may or may not be changing. Um, if they have, you know, if it's a situation where they may be needing to, uh, like, update vendor amounts, um, you know, if they, they can run that 1099 program after closing, so, you know, part of me thinks they may be good to just proceed and then run it. Um, if they had any changes to like amounts and stuff, I would think that you would want that to be in live. Um, and they could do, you know, now that they have the option to. Um, but I mean, you could do a demo land if you want to. I don't know, Michelle, do you have thoughts on that? Um, yeah, Deb, I don't see any need either for like a demo account of any kind either. I mean, just like Amanda said, um, you know, you're going in and making those changes and then, um, you know, and when you're running that 1099 file, you've got that year to pull from. So um, that's what's nice about the redesign is that you don't have to have any of those backup accounts like that. So um, that shouldn't be necessary to do that. The same holds, I, true, the same holds true for payroll as well. You don't need a backup like you did in the past. And I think honestly, the, if they are worried about like, you know, having to reopen periods and stuff, I really think that's just going to be for the monetary amounts. You know, if they're just uh, reviewing vendor data um, and then generating that file, um, you know, if they're, yeah, worried like they already closed, I think it would really just be if they need to enter vendor adjustments where they would be looking at having to reopen periods. Correct. Absolutely. So if they were to change like a vendor's name or address, 
it would go ahead and pull onto the 1099 file without changing back to a prior period if you enter that vendor change in live in January? I, I believe so. Um, okay, that's right. All right. I haven't specifically yeah. tested it recently, but <laughs> didn't want to talk myself, <laughs> didn't want to say the wrong thing there, but yeah. Um, at the time that it's generated, it should look at that vendor record um, because the changes there aren't necessarily like time stamped, you know? So for accounting, the only time they would have to reopen the prior period uh, to run their 1099s would be if they are actually making adjustments to the year to date total. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And they really could just, they really only need to open, reopen that period to put in the adjustment. So they could, you know, reopen the period, put in the adjustments, and they don't even have to make it current. They just can reopen it, put in the adjustments, close it, and then they could still run the 1099 program with those adjustments after, after it's been closed again. It just bases it on whichever payment year is selected. And make sure that they go in and delete the monthly season bundle before they Yes. Period again. Yes. Okay. So well, would, they, would would it be advisable for these districts maybe then just that they open January and leave December open instead of reopening December and then close it when they're done? They could do that. So, like, especially if we're looking, you know, if we're talking about a situation that, um, like, Deb gave the example of where they want to move on and, um, you know, they're concerned with how it's going to connect with payroll and that sort of thing, they absolutely could open January but, and make that make January current, but if they wanted to leave December open, you know, to give them time to review, then they could do that for sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the USAS side here. Um, if you guys do end up coming up with any other questions, just uh, let us know, put in a ticket. Um, we are happy to help. And I think we'll just probably take a minute here to get switched over to Lori, and then we'll start up with payroll. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you see my screen all right? Um, I'm on the uh, wiki page. I just want to make sure everyone is seeing the page, the page all right before I begin. You can see it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so again, in case someone came in late, um, I just wanted to take you to our uh, SSDD public, public wiki page. and. Um, Again, this is the page that you can go to as far as if you wanted to look at documentation for Classic, which is the USPS documentation, or the USPSR documentation, which is the redesign. But then for today, like Amanda showed earlier, we could go to this SSDT meetings and trainings. So if you at your ITC want to actually use, you know, if you want to tweak it to make it your own, um, you would just go into the redesign 2019 ITC calendar year end. And then you can see, like Amanda had said, here's our agenda for today. And then for the payroll portion, here are all of our diff different documents. Um, we have the, the calendar year end review PowerPoint, as well as like all of the supporting documentation that we have regarding what is in that. But we, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we have the changes, it's a PowerPoint for the upcoming year for 2020, as well as some changes for 2019. And then we have a, uh, the, the calendar year and closing checklist. And again, this is something you can take and tweak it to make it your own. So I, we just wanted to show you where that was located. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our calendar year and review. So, um, 
the first thing that we want to make sure, and uh, as Amanda had said, if you weren't in on her conversation, um, the SSA file as well as your state tax, tax file is due to be submitted by January 31st. So you have to tell your districts accordingly to make sure that they get you their files so you can get all that data appended and sent or uploaded to the site before January 31st or by January 31st. Um, one thing you want to tell your districts is if they have school district uh, payroll item configuration records, they want to make sure that on the W-2 abbreviation field that they have the uh, OSDI code as well as a portion of the school district name. Uh, that was kind of changed last year because the state of Ohio um, was asking for it because a lot of districts were submitting data. They had like city taxes that they paid as well as school district. Well, the, the names were the same and there was some confusion as far as like what was what. And so that's why we're having them make sure that they enter the OSDI code as well as a portion of the school district name on that payroll item configuration record. Um, another thing that your districts are going to want to do is verify that the entity code on any city tax uh, payroll item configuration record is set up. And here's a screenshot of a payroll item configuration record for a city. And that tax entity code field is highlighted here. So we, we just want to make sure that that is set. And uh, another reason that we want to make sure that that is set up is because if you as the ITC create city submission files for those uh, districts, for those cities, that is part of the, the uh, qualifying data that needs to be included. So you can, you know, kind of filter out particular cities. Um, for CCA and RITA reporting, the districts are going to want to verify the values on the payroll item configuration, configuration record as well. Um, they want to make sure that they have everything set up uh, properly. And here's a screenshot of like a CCA, or sorry, a RITA record. And you'll see that the RITA code as well as the RITA description is defined on that record. So the districts are going to want to make sure if they have a RITA city that that, that data is populated on that uh, record. And then here are your CCA, a copy of the CCA record. Same thing applies. You want to make sure that you have the CCA code as well as the CCA description defined. Another thing for the CCA and RITA records as well is the uh, deduction type, whether they're paying into the city because they're employed at the, in the city or because they're a resident of the city. We want to make sure that that field is also created and populated on that record. And that would actually be on the uh, payroll item record. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go back. Deduction type. I got to go back here. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we want to make sure that that is set up correctly on uh, the CCA, the payroll item record, which is the employee record, because the payroll item configuration record wouldn't have that. This is specific to particular employees. So we got to make sure that payroll item record that is defined so that it gets processed uh, correctly when the, uh, the, the records are getting created for the W-2s. Oops, I went ahead of myself here. Really getting ahead of myself, okay. Um, for health savings accounts, uh, even if a district, maybe they have a record created for a health savings account, but there's no employee, employees that are having it withheld, that payroll item configuration record still needs to have um, the, the, uh, the uh, type set to other for that particular record. And you can see the annuity type on the payroll item configuration record for the health savings account for this district is set to other. So you just want to make sure your districts are aware of that. Um, there are employee expense reimbursements, and those were normally uh, payments that were made from the USAS side to a district, but they want that to be included on the W-2. If that's the case, we do have a, a particular document out there under the wiki that um, 
has different scenarios that you can look at and then it tells you like how to go in and what you need to do in order to process adjustments for those particular expenses. So that information, like I said, there's several different scenarios on that document that will explain that. And then again, that's going to be done through the, the core adjustments option. Hey, Lori. Yes. Um, I noticed that now there is a pay type um, other than, you know, miscellaneous regular that is non-taxable um, reimbursements. Like, yeah. it, it looks like you could use it to pay, say, mileage or something that it wouldn't. Yes. We actually, actually, on the, uh, in future or current, there's there's this, there's kind of like three different pay types. There's that life insurance premium, which we'll talk about shortly. Then there's the non-cash tax benefit, which is like in classic that would have been like your NC3. But like you said, they do have that third one, which is uh, non-taxable reimbursement. So that could be used as well. But I mean. Um, like you said, cell phone reimbursement, if they don't process that like through payroll, because a lot of districts do, they, they could probably use that non-taxable reimbursement option for that if they wanted to. So either way, you could use adjustments or they could use that as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, then we have the moving expenses, and this did change last year. That only applies or applies to anybody that is an active military employee or person. So like districts may have like an employee that is in the military, so that could affect them. But um, if that's the case, uh, the reimbursements are made to uh, directly to a third party uh, just for the active military employees. And if that's the case, under adjustments, we have an option for moving expenses. So under adjustments, that's where that information would be entered in for the excludable moving expenses. And as we always say as a caveat, the district should probably contact their legal advisor if they have questions on that. Um, the fringe benefits amount, again, another thing that can be added through the core adjustments option. Um, Again, we suggest that if they have, if districts have questions, that they should contact their legal advisor just to verify before they enter this information in. Um, so what they would do is go into the core adjustments and they would enter the uh, taxable amount in the fringe, uh, the, the, choosing the fringe benefits option. And um, the tuition, re okay, tu excuse me, tu tuition, I can't say that word, reimbursement, anything above $5,250 is considered a fringe benefit. So if the amount that, let's just say that they reimburse them for uh, $6,250, so the amount, that amount is above the $5,250, they're going to have to go into adjustments under that federal tax payroll item. So they'll find the employee choose the federal tax payroll item, and then um, they would choose the fringe benefit type, and then they're going to go ahead and they're going to put in that $1,000, which is above the 5250 When they click the Save button to save the record in adjustments, that's going to update the total and taxable growth field um, for the payroll item that taxes fringe benefits. So basically, that's going to update the federal and it's going to update the state total and taxable growth fields. And then that information will, will be reflected on the W-2 report. So we have the life insurance above $50,000. Um, the ideal situation, and this doesn't always happen for your district, but the ideal situation is to get all of this entered in before the last pay of the calendar year or if an employee, you know, has retired, maybe they retire back in March, it would be good if that information had been entered in or um, if, if not, then they're going to have to do a different, different way of processing it. But the ideal situation, like I said, is to go in and on the last pay 
of that employee's employment or before the calendar year is done, if these employees are still being paid, go in and use the life insurance premium pay type under future, or you can see it under current as well. And then when you do use that life insurance premium pay type through the payroll process, what will happen is it's going to actually with, uh, it'll update all of your, uh, your, it'll update the federal, state, school district, and city if applicable, and your Medicare total and taxable growth all at one time. When you enter this in, you're going to be entering it in on the federal record. So basically, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we're doing it through future. Jump back. We're doing it through future, but everything will get updated accordingly. The only thing um, you got to make sure of, like I said, make sure you process this before your last calendar year end pay. That's if you're processing it through. Because if you do it that way, then Medicare taxes for board and employee or employee board, however it's paid, whether it's pickup or whatever, gets withheld. It gets taken out. Now, if for some reason the district did not process the life insurance premium payment through future, they forgot to do it, the person left back in March, they didn't do it. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to go in to the adjustment journal, they'll find the employee, they'll choose the federal record, uh, the federal record, the type, federal record, and then they're going to choose the life insurance type option under that federal record, and then they're going to enter in a transaction date and then the dollar amount for the life insurance premium. When they do that, they click save. What happens is it manually updates in the system the total and taxable growth fields on the payroll items, the federal, the state, the school district and city if applicable, and the Medicare. So all of the total and taxable amount on those records is updated in the system. The only thing that the district has to remember is it does not withhold the Medicare that needs to be withheld for that life insurance premium. So with that being said, either the board has to pay their amount and then they have to get the money from the employee, or a lot of times what happens is it's usually a minimal amount, and so the board will just take care of paying for both the employee and the employer portion. Or if it's all board pickup, the board just pays everything. Um, the only thing is, what, if, since the board's doing that, or that they got the money from the employee, the, the district has to go back into the adjustment journal and enter in that Medicare withholding that they paid. So if they paid, let's just say that the board paid the employee and the employer share. The district is going to go in to the adjustment journal. They're going to add an adjustment journal on the Medicare record for amount withheld, which is the employee amount, and however much the board paid for that employee amount. They're going to add another adjustment journal entry for the 692 record, and it's going to be the board amount withheld. Same thing. They're going to put in the, the transaction date and the amount. That way, when, you run, when they're processing the W-2, they're not going to get a fatal error saying the Medicare amount does not equal 1.45% of the, the taxable growth. They want to make sure that they get that taken care of, they get it paid. So that's just something that to keep in mind to tell the district to make sure that they do that um, if they actually forgot or if they forgot or did not have the chance to enter that life insurance premium before the last pay of the calendar year. Um, for dependent care, if the uh, district is not using a dependent care payroll item type, because there are dependent care payroll item types being used, so they're just processed during the normal payroll processing. But if they don't have that set up, then they need to manually enter dependent care amounts um, for W-2 reporting purposes. And the way they do that, again, they're going to go through the adjustments, the core adjustments, and the maximum amount, if you're married filing joint, is $5,000. If you're unmarried or uh, unmarried couple or you're filing single, it's $2,500. And if, if you're married, 
let me go back, 5,000 for married filing joint, unmarried couples, and single. Or if you're married filing separate, it's only 2,500. Sorry, I wanted to get that straight. Um, so they would go into court adjustments and enter in the information under, again, under the federal record. And they would choose that <coughs> dependent care type, use the transaction date, and then the dollar amount that they need to put in for the dependent care. Again, when they click the Save button in the, in the adjustments, the total taxable growth fields are going to be updated for that dependent care, and it's going, to, it's going to update the federal, the state, the city records, and then that's going to be reflected on the W-2 report. And then that dollar or that amount <coughs> is going to be shown on the dependent care field, which is in box 10 on the W-2, so that information will be added on box 10 on the W-2. If the district had an employee that used the company vehicle, um, there's a calculated lease vehicle value. They're going to manually enter that lease vehicle value through, a, again, core adjustments. There's a, a type on there that's called vehicle lease. And again, that would be under the payroll item, the federal tax 001 record. They put in their transaction date and the dollar amount. And again, when they save that record, when they save the adjustment journal, the total and taxable growth will get updated um, just on the federal and state record. And then that's going to be reflected on the W-2. It'll, it'll increase those total and taxable growth field amounts. And then that vehicle lease amount is, uh, is, is uh, populated on box 14 on the W-2. So that will be reflected as well. Employer-sponsored health care costs on the W-2. Um, again, back when the Affordable Care Act required employers to report the total amount of employer-sponsored group health care. So when we talk about <coughs> employer-sponsored health care, that includes employer and employee amounts. So both amounts are totaled together. That's what's going to be showing on the W-2. So um, it's not used for anything other than it's just informational for the IRS is pretty much what it is. Um, if an employee is paying the insurance out of their own pocket, the amount can be added to the adjustment screen. So they would just go into adjustments and create and then find the employee. Um, they would find the payroll item, whatever they have, the district has set up for that particular health care record. And then um, they would choose from the drop down under the type option, they would choose the health care type. They put in the transaction date and then the dollar amount that the employee paid for that whole calendar year. They could enter in the description if they wanted to, it's strictly optional, and then they make sure that they save that record. Here's another scenario. If the employee insurance was paid half a year out of pocket and then the other half for payroll, uh, the amount paid by the employee for that half a year, it needs to be added um, to the adjustment journal. And so you're going to add that information pretty much the same way that you find the employee, choose the, uh, you're going to, but this time you're going to be choosing the federal tax uh, item. And then under type, <coughs> you choose the health insurance, put in your date, or choose your date under the dollar amount and description if you want to and click the save option. Um, then you're going to manually enter only the amount not tracked in the payroll system in core adjustments. So um, anything that you basically didn't keep track of in the system, so if you have like board amounts or whatever that you don't keep track of in the system, you can manually enter that in this health insurance field as well on the adjustments. Again, you're going to be using that federal tax record choosing the health insurance type, and then entering the amount that was not tracked in the system. Uh, but, Lori? Yes. Um, this is Mary Atlaka. In Classic, if you put something in that field on the 01, it overrode. Correct. So, um, so this is an add to, so you only put in the additional amounts, not the total amount. Right. That's the way it worked, yes. 
it, so basically, okay. it's taking, it should be taking that amount plus whatever is on the record. So yes. And if I, Mary, if, there, if, if anything's changed, I'll let you know that. But because things have, have changed since last year. And, you know, like you, you go in and it's like, oh, okay, it's not working like it used to. But as of right now, correct. That is correct. Okay, this is our first year on it, so we just wanted to make sure that we're yeah. clear on that. Thank yep. you. And if anything changes, I will let you guys know that. But that's the way, that's how it worked last year, and I tested it this year, it worked. So, but that doesn't mean that it's going to stay like that. <laughs> but I will let everybody know if something does change. So uh, when the Save button is clicked, it's going to update the total employer health coverage uh, was held on the W-2 report for reporting purposes. Um, again, you have to report that cost of employer health coverage in box 12. That, that uses the code of DD. Um, that's for any district that has 250 or more W-2s for the pre uh, preceding calendar year. So if they had 250 uh, W-2s last year, they're probably going to have to report that this year. Um, one thing to keep in mind to tell your district that life, dental, and vision they, they don't have to be included. It's only if those are all like included in this, like an umbrella, like a whole healthcare thing, then they're included. But if they're like a separate uh, deduction or separate, you don't have to include that information, only the healthcare. And another thing to tell your districts is the health savings account is not included as employer-sponsored healthcare. That's a whole separate, uh, code that goes in box 12, that's code W. So you got to make sure that the district doesn't pretty much, there's a box that you mark on the payroll item configuration record for that employer sponsor health care. You want to make sure that on the health savings account deduction or payroll item that that is not checked because that does not get included in the employer sponsor health care. Um, the employer health coverage on the regular or annuity payroll item configuration um, is used, and we just talked about that. So uh, if this is employer health coverage, if, if that box is, box is checked, the year-to-date payroll item total will be included in the total move to the employee W-2 for health coverage. And here's a screenshot of your payroll item configuration record. So this is just an annuity that ha that's set up for health insurance. But you can see that that box uh, is checked for that employer health coverage. So that's just, it's just like in classic on the dead name record, they had that box checked. That's what the, that's how the system knows, hey, I got to pull this in so it gets included on the W-2 for employer health care. If the district only tracks the employee portion of health care costs in the payroll system, they only do the employee amount, they don't do the employer amount, uh, the district is going to want to somewhere or another get the employer amount into the payroll system in order to get that on the W-2. So they can do that by creating a spreadsheet with the employer amounts that they paid for their calendar year, and then they could use mass load to load that data into that payroll item in the employer um, year-to-date uh, withheld field. And, um, if the, if the district does that, that's fine, but they're going to want to make sure that they go out and look at the documentation, which I have a link to, because the headings have to be set up correctly. And again, they could probably just uh, keep, you know, keep if they keep track of it. A lot of districts have a spreadsheet that they just keep track of that information. Then if, if that's the case, they could just save that document and then just copy it and put the correct headers in and then upload it into the system. Um, again, we have the utilities mass load. That's where they're going to actually go in and you choose the mass load option. Um, <coughs> um, they're going to use the, the adjustment journal is the importable entity that they're going to be loading it to. And that will be the amount, again, the employer amount of medical insurance coverage. If the system is, or system, if the district is not currently, again, processing the board portion of the paid medical through payroll, um, just keep in mind, if they wanted to start, like, this new calendar year, they can track the employer amount through the payroll system, 
It doesn't mean that they have to um, process employer distributions for that particular item. They can just track it, you know, like how much how much is paid, then they don't have to worry about mass loading, all that information for the following calendar year. They can just keep track of, you know, each pay when it's withheld, it'll keep updating the year-to-date amount paid, and then at the end of the year, all that data will be available. And if they want to do that, all they, just, all they have to do is just make sure that they go into the payroll item configuration record and leave the object codes on that, um, those particular items blank. And then, then there's no mistake made, you know, when they're running employer distributions, but at least they're keeping, they can track how much the employee or the employer is paying over the calendar year. The health reimbursement arrangement, that was added last year, and it pretty much only affects um, employers that, they're like small, uh, small business employers, so if, they only have like 50 full-time employees or less, they could, they could use this health reimbursement arrangement. And that is pretty much, it, uh, if they qualify, they basically are reimbursing medical care expenses to employees that are eligible for it um, throughout the calendar year. And if they do that, that information can get reported on the W-2 in box 12 with the code of FS. And so if you have, and I would all think this, but it almost only affect maybe like some community schools possibly, because most school districts, most, have more than 50 employees, possibly not, but if that's the case, um, they could actually go in and use this. We have a health reimbursement option that they could use so they could get that set up accordingly. And um, if they do, they can go to the adjustment, core adjustments option, and we have, under the federal record, a health reimbursement type where they could actually go in and enter that information in in order to get it to process on the W-2. Um, for W-2 reports and for submission features, when we go into um, reports under the W-2 report and submission option, there's several different options available. We have the W-2 report, which is basically used for balancing. So the district could start running that even right now if they wanted to. They could start running that, start balancing, making sure everything is lining up. Then we have the W-2 form, which is used, the, the, the form data XML file, which is used for the laser printing. So like they use that file, uh, the district creates the file, they will, um, you know, transfer it out to their desktop or wherever, and then securely they send that to the ITC, and the ITC prints out the, the W-2 for the district using that XML file. Then we, it also creates a W-2 tape, which is what is used for the uh, submission to the SSA, and it's also used for your Ohio, yeah, State of Ohio taxes as well. Um, this, these screens just kind of tell you like how to create the report. Uh, this is more for like district use. I'm sure the ITCs pretty much know, you know, where you need to go and what you need to do. But it gives details about, you know, what the field names are and then uh, what basically are your options and what you need to put in uh, those fields if, if, if you have to populate those fields. The kind of employer, the district, again, they have to make sure that they specify uh, if they're a state and local government employer or, um, uh, what's the other option? I can't remember. Uh, I think it was federal. Where are you at? I know I have it written down. Here it is. <laughs> okay. If, there's, if the school district is a part of a local government and has not applied for a 501C status, they will check uh, the box for state, local, non-501C which is an S, and I think most of the school districts are like that. But there could be, again, maybe a community school that has applied for 501C status and was granted that nonprofit status. So if that's the case, then they would, uh, choose, the, or they would choose the option Y when they're processing the W-2 report. 
or when they're creating a submission file. And then when you're in W2 report submission, at the bottom of the screen, let me go ahead, I'm going to pull up just so you guys can see. You, you've seen it before, but just to refresh your memory. Pull that screen up so you can see it. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. There we go. All right. So under reports, W2 report and submission. It's kind of tired this morning. It's Friday, so it's tired. Okay. So again, you can see at the top we do have three tabs. We have a W2 reports option, W2 city option, and W2 state option. But under the reports option, you can see where we have the output type is report. So again, this is what I was talking about. If districts want to start running their report, they can do that now. Do it as many times as they want to. We have a submission option. So under reports, you can see it's pretty basic. But one thing to keep in mind, which is really nice, we do have sorting options. So they could sort by name, whatever they wanted to sort by. If they want to include fringe benefit box in box, or fringe benefits in box 14, uh, if they only wanted to report employees that have errors, they could just check that box. Um, another thing to keep in mind, if there's only particular payroll item configurations that they wanted to add, they could do that here. They could just go in and choose a particular payroll item if they only wanted to see that at the bottom, see the dollar amount, they can do that. All they have to do is select the item and then click Add, and it adds it to this box down here. If they want to get rid of it, just click the X. Nice thing is we have the same feature to do employees. So you could just select only particular employee or employees. Type in their name or their ID, a portion of their name. And again, you just have to click the Add button, and it puts them down here. But when I do that, I can go in and click Generate Report, and then it's going to give me the W-2 report just for that particular employee. If I want everybody, I can just go in here. I don't even have to select the pay groups because if I want everyone that's going to get a W-2, all I have to do is just click the Generate Report, and then it's going to create my report for me. And again, you, you've seen these because you've probably migrated districts in, and when you do that, you may be comparing the classic report to the redesign report. So when that, when that processes, it lists each employee with all of their federal information, all of their, you know, uh, if they have Medicare pickup, all that information is all included. And then at the bottom of your report, you have all of your uh, payroll items. So you have all of your ta city taxes, your federal, state, et cetera, everything's on there. So that's your report. And again, they can run that as many times as needed. Then we have the submission option, which is when they're going to actually create the submission file for them to send to you so you can upload it or, you know, append it and then upload it. So when they have that, you'll notice that their, their federal uh, ID number already pulled in and then as well as their state ID number, the kind of employer already pulls in as an S, that's the default. So if they needed to change it, just go to the drop down. How they're sorting, what calendar year we're in, the name of the uh, district or the employer and their address. And then the, the employee has to make sure that they go in and see where these red boxes are at. They have to make sure that those fields are populated. If they don't, What's going to happen is when you as the ITC start pending and trying and take that file and you try to check it through AccuAge, you're probably going to get an error message because those fields are required to be populated when they're creating the submission file. And then down here you can see where they could go in and click the Generate SSA W2 submission file. So when they do that, they're going to create the submission file for the SSA save it, and then upload it to you securely. 
however, you know, whatever secure means that they have to upload. You can also see that they can generate a CCA or a RETA file. So if they have CCA or RETA districts, they're going to go in and you uh, click on those options as well. And they're going to do the same thing. They'll save those file, that file that gets created, and they're going to securely upload it to you at the ITC so you can do the submission for them. Now, one thing that we have talked about, and I talked to Mark about this a little bit yesterday, um, eventually we will try, we're going to try to get something out there that will allow the districts to submit their own tape files. But like right now, because we're putting <coughs> header information into, and trailer like total information on those files when we do those appends and we run that W2 tape procedure, they can't submit those files on their own because if they did, if they tried to, it's, it's probably going to blow up, it's going to air out on them. But I know Mark said eventually down the line we're going to try to give the option if you at the ITCs want your districts to be able to submit their own, they'll be able to do that. But that's coming down the line eventually, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that so you knew. Um, under the W2 city option, again, we have the same thing. They have to make sure that they put the tax entity code in because they could be running this for many different cities. So maybe they have like an 003 and a, or not 003, that's the deduction, but like the tax entity code. Remember we talked about that earlier that that has to be populated in order to be able to create these files. That's one of the reasons. So you're going to put that code in and it's going to cr uh, create the file and it's going to be um, something like W2 city with the entity name and then .seq. It will create that information for you. And again, they're going to have to send that file to you as well if you create special cities um, files for them and you upload them. And then another thing we have is the state option, which we're going to go back to that. I'm not going to talk about that right at this minute because that's going to come when we talk about the changes. So let's just get through all of this. We kind of just talked about all of this. We talked about all that. This is creating, like I said, your XML file that they're going to be sending to you. Okay. Um, one thing, if they want to include additional uh, payroll item or deduction codes, um, it allows the district to print those additional codes on the W-2. They could enter in six different codes if they want to. Now, the lease vehicle value is included. That's the first one that's always included. And then other values are secondary. So going back, we'll go back here. We'll go back to this option. No. Oops, sorry. We want the XML option. I'm like, I'm like, where is the option at? Here it is. Okay, and this will, you'll see right here. <coughs> so it says select payroll items to print in box 14. So here is where you could go in and put all those extra items. Maybe you have like union dues or United Way or whatever you want to be included on that box for them, or retire or the retirement SRS TRS. You could choose all those different items, but you just have to make sure you choose like one of them, choose it and make sure you click add. That way it's going to get included when you create the XML file. Oh, back again. Well, I said you can allow, you can uh, add up to six, but it will only print the first three on the W-2 for the employees. So basically whatever you put in, let's say you have an employee that had a lease vehicle and then you want retirement, so SCR or STRS and maybe union dues and something else. Okay, you put all of those codes in. For this employee, he has all four of those things, okay? It's, it's going to show his lease vehicle, probably his retirement, his union dues, and then whatever the fourth one is, it's not going to show because it's only going to print the first three that are, that are chosen or the first three that are on that list. Um, the information that processes on the W-2 report, so when they start running the W-2 report, it should balance to their 941 totals that they reported, you know, throughout the year. Um, 
the, the district could run an, er, run an earnings register. Um, <clears throat> the payroll items represent the amounts that were withheld during the calendar year. So whatever was withheld for the calendar year, that's what the amount is on the, on the report, on the earnings register. Uh, they're going to also want to run the quarter report, and that's going to show them the current year-to-date figures on the, on the quarter report. So they're going to want to balance the federal, the state, and the city tax and gross amounts. So they want to balance all that information on the, on the W-2 report, compare it to the earnings register and the quarter report. Uh, we have a, that nine, the W-2 uh, reconciliation sheet. We have a reconciliation sheet out there. So the districts can keep track of that throughout the whole year if they want to. Um, and off of that sheet, you can see that the two totals, the year-to-date total and the W-2 report total, should equal, except for special payments. So if there were special payments made, maybe you did like a, uh, um, like a reimbursement payment. That information isn't, probably isn't going to be included. It won't be included in here because you're not including it when you're doing your reconciliation form. You're doing that at the end of the year. So here is a, this is like a screenshot of your earnings register, and here is the employee, uh, the employee amount information. <clears throat> and that's what's going to be used when you're doing your balancing. The employee amount is going to be used. Your quarter report, you're going to be using a year-to-date deduction, deducted total. So that amount in that column is going to be used for, for their balancing, when they're balancing the two out. And then the W-2 report uh, amount in the, w, in the tax withheld field on the report is used for the balancing as well. So some items that might affect the district's balancing between the W-2 report and the quarter report. Um, we have a, a document out there, it's called Specific Effects um, of I can't remember the name of it. Specific effects, I know that, but we have that document out there and it'll show like there's specific situations that will affect W-2 reporting. It's called effects of specific situations on W-2 reporting. That document is out there on the wiki under our, our documentation in the calendar year end meeting. So some things that may affect the balancing are your dependent care limit over 5,000. So if you have a district that uses adjustments and manually enter that in, that's going to affect balancing. It's going to make your, your totals off. Your, your W-2 is going to appear higher than your quarter. Same thing with French benefits, anything Medicare pickup amount, any taxable third-party sick pay that you might have entered in, uh, use of a company vehicle, and then employee expense reimbursement pay through warrant. Again, all of that is going to make your W-2 report look higher than your quarter report because that wasn't processed through the normal payroll. It was just processed through adjustments. Um, we talked about the dependent care benefits. I don't know why I had a second screenshot in there. <laughs> we did that again. Okay. Um, for fringe benefits, uh, the adjusted fringe benefits entry on the 01 record, so we talked about that. It's going to cause the gross to look higher on the W-2 report. And then the Medicare pickup is going to cause that to look, to look higher as well, which we just talked about that. Uh, the tax employer amount. Um, if, you're, if your city, let's go back, if your city record taxes employer amounts, and the box is unchecked on the, on the payroll item configuration record, the Medicare pickup box uh, is going to be checked if the city taxes the pickup. Um, but if you're not withholding the Medicare pickup during the payroll process, the employee is going to pay the taxes on that inflated amount for the city uh, taxable growth after the fact. It depends on how that city payroll item configuration record is set up. And here is an example of what I'm talking about. We, they have the Medicare pickup box checked, but they do not have the tax employer amounts checked. So that basically means it's going to inflate the taxable growth, but no additional tax is being withheld when they process it through payroll. So that means the employee at the end of the year when they file their city taxes, 
probably going to owe the city money because of that inflated amount from the pickup. If the tax employer amount is used on the city record and they also have the tax employer amount box checked, then the tax is being withheld during the, the payroll process and it's going to appear on the W-2 with the inflated city, you know, the taxable growth, as well as the, the, the amount paid on that inflated amount so that they won't have to pay anything or they shouldn't have to pay anything when they file their city taxes. Uh, we have taxable third-party sick pay. If the, uh, the district gets their taxable third-party sick pay documentation, um, the user needs to add that third-party sick pay information using adjustments. Uh, the total growth and adjustments, taxable growth on the federal record, Ohio and OSCI records as needed. So they're going to have to go in and adjust all three of those things, the federal, the state, and the school district as they need to, as needed. They're going to have to adjust the total growth and the taxable growth using the adjustment screen. And when they do that, it's going to, again, um, when they run W-2 reports, it's going to make those uh, amounts for the total tax growth appear higher than the quarter report. Um, we have a document under the wiki for our year-end meeting for third-party sick pay instructions. We have an actual sample document, like what they might see from the, the vendor that they get, and then also um, what needs to be done, you know, like what fields need to be updated in order to get that report on the W-2. And so here's just a screenshot of what, I, what we just talked about as far as like what they need to basically adjust when they're using adjustments. Um, if, they, if they are told that the third party sick pay is not taxable, so basically the one we just talked about is taxable, but if they got information from the third party vendor that it's non-taxable, that information will be included on the W-2 but it does not affect your balancing. It doesn't affect the taxes or anything. What they need to do is they just need to go into adjustments. Um, on the federal tax record, they're going to use the third-party pay type option, and then they're going to enter that inf the information in that they got from the, the third-party vendor, and then that amount is going to just appear on box 12 with the code of J. Again, it's not going to affect anything as far as their balancing, their taxes, or anything, but they will want to make sure that they enter that information in so it gets uh, reported on the, on the W-2. And here's just a screenshot of that third-party sick pay, non-taxable. Again, the company vehicle, the leasing vehicle information, that will make the, the uh, taxable growth and total growth appear to be higher on the W-2. And so will the employee expense reimbursement, as we talked about earlier. Um, if districts have ba balancing problems, which a lot of times they do at the end of the calendar year, um, the first thing that we usually tell them is uh, it could be because they had a void check from a prior calendar year. We normally told them to check the check, to go to the payments check register so they can go out under payments, go to the check register, and on the grid, use the issue date or the pay date. Uh, they would enter in the beginning date and then two dots and the ending date. So basically the beginning of the calendar year to the end of the calendar year and also filter using the status of V. And then they could pull up all checks that were voided within the calendar year. So that may help them determine, you know, maybe that, that's part of the problem with their balancing. Um, to pull out refund of annuities withheld in the prior calendar year, they can go to payments and then go to the refund checks and then uh, show the date issued on the grid just like we did with the voided. They can go in and put in the beginning of the calendar year date to the end of the calendar year date or wherever, you know, whatever, whatever dates they want to use. I just noticed I have 21, 1221 instead of 1231. I think that's a typo. <laughs> and then they'll click on the report, and um, they can do the same option for the refund ACH tab. So they can go into checks, and then they can go to the refund ACH tab, and they can find refunded uh, checks or refunded uh, direct deposits. 
um, if there were manual changes made. And this, I know the audit trail right now is not a real good option because we don't have that really, really working well. I mean, if you use it, it pretty much audits everything, which is a big problem because anytime you run the audit report, if you're going to run it, make sure you specify particular dates because if you don't, it'll run forever because, like I said, the audit trail right now is not a real good option because it audits everything. When I say everything, I mean every anything that's done through payroll processing, everything is audited. And so with that being said, the report could be very large. And so you could run it, but just make sure you specify beginning and ending date. And um, like I said, it could take a little while to run, but you may, may be able to find uh, a manual update that was made, and that could be causing your balancing issue. And then here's just a screenshot of your W-2 report uh, where the information is coming from, so like special amounts for the W-2s, which is like your, your HSA, your 457, and it just tells you where these items on this report come from, you know, from payroll items, from the calculated gross, taxable gross, et cetera. Um, another common uh, W-2 error messages, uh, the calculated annuity amount exceeds the total annuities. So that pretty much tells you if the total gross minus the, the applicable gross is greater than the total annuity from the year-to-date deductions. So, um, you're, again, you're going to want to like look and see if there were manual adjustments made or if there are any error adjustments that were made. Uh, if there's an error that's an invalid SSN, uh, they're going to want to verify the Social Security number, maybe have the employee bring in their Social Security card and um, using the grid, locate the employee, click on the edit button, and then update the Social Security number to get that corrected on the employee record. Uh, another error message they could get is that Medicare does, amount does not equal 1.45% of Medicare gross. So that might mean that the Medicare tax is incorrect. So you're going to want to go through and verify your amounts um, and just have your districts know that if that's the case, the SSA, when you try to, when you guys try to upload that file, it may throw that back to you with an error because the amounts are incorrect. It doesn't like that. It's not going to, may not accept that file. Um, again, if if it, that kind of an error, the Medicare error is is on the on the report on the error report. They can you can verify manual adjustment updates, but then also check the Medicare pickup records. So. If they have pickup and they have either if they use the 692 or if they use the 693, if it's pickup only, make sure that the employer amount actually shows the 2.9%. Another error is a negative annuity on file. So uh, a total negative annuity shows that a check was voided, basically. And we talked about running the you know different reports, maybe trying to find the voided checks. Um, if the district wants to, they want to show that that refund was withheld in the current year instead of the prior year, depending on how much it was. I mean, if it was a large amount, more than likely they may have to file a, a W-2C and W-3C for the prior calendar year. But if they want to just include it as an amount uh, withheld and refunded in the current calendar year, they could just go into core adjustments and zero out the annuity amount by entering a, a positive figure that coincides with the negative figure. So maybe if there's not a zero, but maybe there's a, a negative amount sitting out there, they could, they could co uh, basically offset it with a positive amount from the adjustments. Uh, and then they would need to increase the total gross, the federal, Ohio, school district, and city, um, if the city honored the annuity initially. The pension plate, uh, pension plan box or pension plan plan. Oh my goodness, pension plan flag. There we go. On the federal record is overriding the W-2 prop calculations. So if that on the federal uh, payroll item record, the pension plan box is marked no. Uh, never no mark no. Never checked the pension plan box. But but they find an active retirement record. This error could come up. 
uh, if, the, if the federal payroll item has a pension plan marked to automatically uh, check the pension plan box, but they find, but they do not find an active retirement record, that can be another reason that this error comes up. And that error for can actually come up, it's very common if you have a student who doesn't pay into like retirement. If he doesn't pay into retirement and you have that, that box that's automatically marked as yes, you might get that error message. And if you do on a student like that, no action is required. The district doesn't really have to worry about it, but it's just a message telling you, hey, something's not quite kosher, something's not matching. Um, there's a, a payroll item, whatever the payroll item is, uh, possible error in the school district growth of the tax. And so that, what that tells us is that the OSCI wages, the, the employee has OSCI, OSCI wages but didn't have any tax withheld. And that message is very common for employees that have very, they get paid very small amounts for wages, and so no taxes withheld. And the district is just going to want to verify, make sure that that, you know, that is actually accurate. And then if that is, usually they don't have to do anything. No actions needed. Another mayor message that they could get is that federal total annuities does not equal total gross less to applicable gross. Um, and so what that means is the, the calculated annuity amount, the gross minus the applicable gross doesn't match the year-to-date annuity amount on the payroll item. Um, so what that could be or mean is that there's a possible problem with the annuity total, a problem with the total gross or a problem with the applicable gross. Maybe they made some adjustments and there's problems with those figures. Um, so what they're going to, what, what, you, what they can do or you at the ICC can help them do is verify that the, if manual adjustments uh, were made. Uh, again, verify maybe if refund of deductions were done because a lot of times that happens when a refund of deduction is made um, and what happens is the taxable growth and everything gets updated when the refund of deduction is made, but the total growth does not. So if they want it to look like it was, it was paid within this calendar year, then they're just going to have to go in and do adjustments on the federal, state, school district, and city record on that total growth field in order to in, include. So whatever they got refunded, if they got refunded $200, they're going to have to go into adjustments and do an adjustment on the federal record for the total growth of $200. Same thing for state, school district, and city. They're going to make sure that they update that total growth field so that error basically goes away. Uh, another error is the, the employee's Medicare wages are less than their Social Security wages. Uh, so that message basically tells us the Medicare wages are not right uh, or, or the Social Security wages are wrong. So you've got to just make sure you check the gross amount on the Medicare and, or Social Security payroll item. And um, if, they have an if they have incorrect amounts, you may have to go into court adjustments and make adjustments to those records, whether it be the 692, 693, whichever records you're making adjustments to as far as Medicare or Social Security. Um, and again, the, the Social Security Administration will not, will, they, they will contact the district if that error is not fixed. So the district really needs to make sure if they ever get this error that they make those corrections before they try to submit their file. Um, specific details on the W-2 uh, form reporting requirements can be found uh, on the IRS.gov page at this link. It's the W-2, W-3 um, instruction page. And I'm not going to go through these one by one, but I just included it on this uh, PowerPoint just so you have reference of it for your district. They may be able to easily go to this and find it, but it just talks about like where on the IRS instructions, the W-2, W-3 instructions, you can find particular things like, like corrections on that, on that document. It can be, they can be found on page 25. So again, all of these particular fields or screens, that fields, just talk about what pages those, uh, those particular items can be found on. Just kind of skip through all of these. Because I don't think you guys really want me to go through each and every one of them. I don't want to bore you. 
Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, hold on, there we go. Okay, a W-3 form is not required for by a district unless they're filing on paper, which I'm pretty sure most of the ITCs don't have any districts that file on paper. Pretty much everybody electronically submits, but if they don't, they'd have to file a W-3C on paper. Basically, W-2 and, or not C, a W-2 and a W-3 on paper. Um, what happens is when we, when we create the W-2s in the system, it's already creating the W-3 form that's required by, by the SSA. So when we're doing electronic submissions, you don't have to worry about a W-3. It's already getting included on the information on the file that gets created. Um, post W-2 processing, if there's corrections that have to be made for a district, maybe they mess something up on, on the W-2, okay, and you at the ITC have not submitted the data yet, um, I guess that's strictly up to you whether you want to tell the districts or not that you've submitted, because if you haven't and you would allow them to make a correction, they can actually go in and kind of like you were talking with Amanda before, they should be able to go in um, and if December posting period is still open, they could just go in and make a correction, an adjustment to whatever, you know, if it's total taxable gross, whatever they're making the adjustment to. They should be able to do that and then they should be able to rerun the W-2 report and submission, create a new submission file and send that to you as well as create a new um, XML file because you're probably going to have to have that file in order to create a corrected W-2 for that employee. So you can do that if you have not submitted the data to the SSA already. That's a possibility. But again, um, only if you, have, if you haven't submitted yet. If you've already submitted the data, then the district is pretty much going to have to file a W-2C and a W-3C um, with, with the SSA because that data has already been reported. So they, they have to basically file those um, corrections manually. Um, preparing for 2020. Uh, before we talk about that, I wanted to talk a little bit too about um, let me go back out here. Where did I put that? Oh, let me go back. I wanted to show you just a couple more of those documents that we have listed out there on the wiki because we do have an updated deceased employee document listed out there <clears throat> because if you have a deceased employee, um, W-2 reporting is a little bit different. You kind of, there's it depends on when they passed away um, and what needs to be done as far as the filing of, of the W-2 because there could be a 1099 that also needs to be filed. So we have that document listed out here. Um, let me just go ahead and pull this back over so you can see it. Maybe. Okay. And put it on here. So if I go ahead and pull up that calendar year end information, you'll see on here that I do have this deceased employee final pay uh, document, and it explains, it goes through everything as far as a deceased employee, like if they passed away in this calendar year, if they passed away, maybe they passed away like last December, but you paid them in January, all of that information is, you can look at this document and that way, make sure that the district knows like what they need to do as far as filing for that employee. Um, also on this uh, documentation, you can see we have a W-2 report example. So it just gives you an uh, example of the W-2 report. We have a copy of the reconciliation sheet that we talked about before, and that's pretty much like they can be using this throughout the whole calendar year and then using that when they're doing their balancing. Um, 
here's your third, those third party uh, documents that we were talking about. We have a third party SIC, which is basically telling you if it's non-taxable and you need to make the adjustments, go in here and do it this way. If it's taxable, this is how they do it. And then we also have just an example of a third party sick pay. This is kind of like what the districts might be getting from the third party vendor. It just shows them, you know, what, what the employee, you know, was paid and that information. Um, we have that specific FX document. And again, if I pull that document up, it's going to show you all of the different scenarios, like um, what happens if uh, you have adoption assistance, assistance cash payment. It's gonna tell you all the information that needs to be, or that relates to that particular scenario. Um, we have the Ohio IT3 form. The helpful links, the helpful links is basically gives you the links for like CCA, for RITA, um, the IRS, W-2 instructions, uh, publications 15 A and B, uh, the State of Ohio Department of Taxation. The uh, expense reimbursements, which we talked about, there's a lot of different scenarios on that. We talked about the deceased employee. Um, the W-2 master tape file creation, I'm gonna open this because this does affect you as, as, the, as the ITC because once you get all of your district's files, you get their sequential files that need to be uploaded or you know appended and then you're going to actually upload that to the SSA. This is just an example document of like what we, what we used in, in the past. But it gives you all, you know, like all the information, what you're going to see when you go in and run W-2 tape. Like when you first go in and run W-2 tape, it'll ask you, you go down here, whether you're creating a master tape file, a RITA, or a CCA. So if I choose master, that's going to be what I'm creating for the SSA. I'm creating the, the header record information for the SSA. And then we're going to, you would choose your start option because you're actually starting to create the master tape file. And then you go in and enter all the required information, like the EIN information, uh, the company information, you enter all that information. I did notice one thing that um, if I didn't add, like, the delivery address information, I noticed, I think it was when I wanted to AccuAge, it kind of threw me in air. So at that point, I thought, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and start creating or entering in the information in the location and in the delivery address. That way, no, nothing pops up. I don't think it, a fa it's not a fatal, but it does give you an error, and I don't like to see errors, so. And this is something, too, you got to make sure that you put in the submitter um, phone number, the submitter contact information, and then also the submitter name. It asks you for those three things as well, right here. And then it gives you, like, a, a, a synopsis or a summary of everything that you entered in. If something was wrong, you could go and make a change to whichever number you need to make a change to. And then what you do is use the appending option. So you find your VMS files from the reflections of the classic system. And then you also have to find your files from the redesign district. And like Amanda said, I would go in and pull in all of your classic or your VMS uh, files first, and then go in and pull in all of your redesign files. And then this just gives you information as far as like how you need to create that new master file. Um, and then when you want to create the take total record, which is like the trailer record or the ending record on the file, you go back in after you've done your append, you're gonna go in and create this file. You go back in W2 tape again, and then this time you would choose the finish option because you're going to finish creating the W2 master tape file. So you choose that, and then um, it again asks you for all the information, address information. I might even pull that in. I think it does. You don't have to type it back in. And then it asks you uh, all employees reside in the U.S. or U.S. territories. 
territory Tories, blah, blah, <laughs> and you choose, you know, the United States. The inventory number, you can just leave that blank. And then select the type of data that you're being that you're reporting. You're reporting the W two originals. You're not doing reconciliations, resubmittals, or W two Cs. So you're doing option number one. And then when you choose that, it's going to create your W two tape text file, a tape text file, and then a W two sixty five fifty nine text file as well. And then those tape files are normally needed. Um, for the SSA, and what you do is after you've created that master file, you're going to run it through AccuAge because AccuAge is going to tell you beforehand, or it should for the most part, when you sub when you upload that file, that master tape file into AccuAge, whether you have errors or not. Because if you have fatal errors when you try to upload it to the SSA website, then you're going to have problems because it will not upload. So AccuAge is a really good tool. It gives you the chance to go in. If you have fatal errors, you're going to make corrections and then you know run the run the corrected file through AccuAge again. And then you got to make sure that you don't have any trailing spaces on your file because if you do, it's going to cause that file to be expanded, which you don't want. Um, so when, once you've ran it through AccuAge, then you could go ahead and go to your the SSA Business Online website, and then you choose that report wages to the Social Security option. And then um, you choose submit or resubmit with the wage file option. And follow the menu options, choosing the uh, W-2, W-3 for tax year 2019 or previous year EFW-2 option. And then you're going to find your W-2 mass sequential file, load that in, and then once you've done that, you, you should get like some submission information that the file was actually submitted. And I normally print that off and then I go back and check periodically just to make sure that the stat, what the status of, you know, if it's been accepted, if it's been loaded, um, then I'm good. So again, the, this is just a sample of what we, what we normally do. And then it talks about your, the state, and your CCA and your RITA and cities as well. It goes through pretty much all of that. Um, for the state, we're going to talk about that in a little bit because there's been some, there's going to be some changes for the state. So we will go back and talk about that shortly. Um, whoops, hold on here. Go back. I wanted to go back and just show you other documents that are sitting out there if I can. I'll take them back. Go. Okay. Well, come on. One more. Hold on. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, another document that we have out there. Whoa, that does not look good. Hold on. Let me pull this back over here. Let me do a little fixing up here before we try this again. Sorry for the delay. Just pull this back up. I want you to be able to see all of this before we continue on. While we're waiting, does anybody have any questions in the meantime here? No questions. Okay. I'm getting this pulled back up, so hold on a second and we will uh, talk about it a little more. All right. Yeah, let's make this bigger. Hey, Lori. Yeah. On the um, online, on the checklist for the USPS, we tried to print that and it is not saved somehow correctly. We try, We finally saved it as a PDF, but it's cutting off a bunch of it. it it's just acting really weird. Is there any way oh. you guys can try to resave that out there again? Yeah. Yep. And the use of that was the double uh, W2 tape. Wait, what? Oh. 
the W-2 tape submission, like creating the like creating the W-2 tape and then submitting it. No, I'm online. talking about the actual USTSR calendar year and closing checklist, the very bottom link. Oh, that you gotcha. Have right on your gotcha. Screen. That whole thing, we can't get it to print right. We're losing okay. a bunch of it. The closing checklist. Yep. Yeah. I will. Uh, I will re re uh, re link that after we're done. Sorry about that. Thank you. And, yep. No problem. And then um, we have the general instructions. Again, I just put those out there for your benefit uh, from the SSA or the IRS.gov website. We've got the uh, publication 15B. The W-2 box is explained, which basically just tells us what goes in every box on the W-2. So that's kind of a nice little feature, you know, to give your district so they have that information. Um, yeah. Okay. And then we have the W-2 form for 2019. I'm not going to pull that up because you know what those look like. I also put on there, it's, uh, it's new, it's a reference guide for the box 12 codes. <coughs> it, it's just like a little box with all of the different codes that go in box 12. So I just put that out there as a reference. Maybe. Doesn't want to pull up very easily. Maybe. There it goes. Okay. Okay. So here's that box. This is what I talked about. So this is all the different codes that could be in box 12 and kind of like what they what they're for. So that's just a document that I kind of threw out there. And then we're going to talk about these in just a few minutes. And then down here is what you were talking about as far as you couldn't get it to print. This is the calendar year on checklist, and we strongly recommend that your district follow these procedures because if they don't, you know, they're going to have problems. But if they follow the procedures, it makes it so much easier. And again, with this checklist right now, it's it's pretty. Um, I was going to say pretty uh, lengthy, and the reason being is because because redesign is so new and so new to a lot of different people. We kind of tell everybody, you know, like where to go, like for payroll future, you know, go to payroll future, click create. We're kind of like going step by step. As we go along and we get all the districts on board and everything is good, obviously we're probably going to be able to shorten this up a little bit. But for right now, if you go through it, it is, it's quite long and it kind of looks like, oh my gosh, really? We got to do everything. But a lot of it is there's just so much information on there um, and that's the reason. And then you'll notice too on here, um, let me just pull up. We have uh, information as far as like, okay, they have to run the ODGFS and create the tape file. We have information on here telling like what the ITC has to do in order to get those files appended in and, and created, included in with the VMS or the classic files as well. So we have breakdowns for everything like your ODJFS, for creating your city files, CCA, for RITA, for your SSA file, all of that. We have all that information on this document for the ITCs. So obviously, if you're going to replicate this for your district, you're going to go in and remove a lot of that stuff because they don't need to know all that information. This is just for the ITC information. So you have that, have that um, at, your, at hand to be able to use. Um, let me go back to this, the PowerPoint because we're just about finished. But I want to talk about preparing for 2020. Um, if districts know that there's going to be um, Tax changes, withholding changes for cities, school districts, um, they're going to go in, they could go out to the, uh, these links and they can actually see, you know, the different cities or different school districts and then the, the, the taxes that they're going to be withholding for 2020. Um, so if they do and they have an increase, 
they could go in, again, the same thing for CCA and RITA. If they have cities under CCA or cities under RITA, they're going to have increases. They can go out to the tax rates or tax tables for 2020 and find that information. Um, the thing about RITA and CCA, I could go out there right now, but I didn't even think, the last I looked, which was just, I think, a week ago, they don't even have the 2020 tax rates out there yet, the 2020 tax tables. So. That's why I just put the links out there and then eventually the districts, they can go out there before the beginning of the year, before their first January payroll to verify and make sure that there's no increases in city taxes for CCA or RITA. Um, if the district is unsure if an employee should be taxed, they can go out and use the, uh, the tax finder um, on the Ohio.gov site and actually look that information up by either address, zip code, if they have the latitude or longitude, they could use, put that in if they wanted to. Um, if they're really, really good, they could do that. Now, if they do have changes for cities or school districts or CCA RITA cities, what they can do is there's two options. They could use the mass load feature, which is basically they could go in and create a report um, from that particular uh, city or school district record and then they can go in and mass load that once they've got the spreadsheet created because they'll create the spreadsheet, update the amount, obviously, because they're going to be changing the amount being withheld, the percentage or whatever. <coughs> and then they can use the uh, utilities mass load option and they're gonna find that CSV file that they created and then uh, appropriately or import it to uh, the, the, uh, the correct payroll item. So let's just say that it's the 003 city record. If they're increasing those rates, they're going to upload that into the importable entity, which is the 003 record. So they're gonna load that into that 003 record. Now, another option would be, whoops, to use the mass change option. So meaning they could go out into um, payroll items, they could go and select that particular city payroll item only, pull, or pull up city taxes, sorry, under the payroll items. Then on the grid, filter for that particular city tax. So again, let's just say 003. So go ahead under the code, put 003 then all they should see on the screen is the 003 city record. They could then go in and create, a, you could have a mass uh, change definition created to change the amount, you know, change the amount, let's say currently it's 1%, you're using amount, and then we're going to put in 1.5%, and then we're going to use that mass load feature to, to mass load the changes all at once to everybody. Those are your two options the mass load or the mass change, either one they can use. And again, on this mass change, we have a note, we suggest the ITCs perform the mass change operation until the districts become more familiarized with this feature. Um, unless you have a district that's very comfortable with mass changing, you're good. But if you don't, I would suggest, you know, that maybe you as the ITC do the mass change for them, for now. But that's strictly up to you as the ITC how you want to handle that. But that's just a little caveat that we have at the bottom there. Okay, are there any questions on everything we've covered so far? You guys are so quiet today. It's Friday, everybody's tired, I know. Okay, now we're going to go into um, the changes for 2019 and 2020. Go ahead and pull that up. And it. Okay. All right, so changes for 2019 and 2020. Not a lot, but there are some like really, there is one really cool change that we're going to talk about. Um, the first thing is, and this probably isn't going to affect a lot of you at TCs, but anybody that might have a district that withholds Pennsylvania taxes and they um, 
file 10 or more W-2s, they're going to actually have to start uploading that uh, file online. So we went out and we actually are, I want to say, half are done. We're half done. We've half created this option in the redesign. So what that means is um, they're going to have to go in and create a Pennsylvania submission file, but they're also going to have to create a CSV file, which is used for the transmittal form part of it, because the transmittal form information is not on the on the the other the sequential file that gets created for Pennsylvania. So what the district is going to do um, is if if they have districts that have Pennsylvania taxes, 10 or more W-2s, um, they're going to go in to the W-2 report and submission option. And let me go here. Yes, I did. Okay. So they're going to go in to that W-2 report submission and report and submission option. And then they're going to choose the W-2 state options tab. When they do that, you're going to see, and you're not going to see this right now because all we have available or we're getting available is the Generate Pennsylvania W-2 submission file. We don't have the CSV option out there yet, but we will have that in place by the time W-2s are being processed. That will be ready. Um, but you can see on this file, again, contact name information, phone number, and email address all are required. You have to enter that information in in order to create the submission file. So they're going to go in to create the submission file, click the generate submission file. That's going to create the file that they're going to actually save. And then they're going to go back in and they're going to use this generate Pennsylvania uh, CSV transmittal file. They're going to create a CSV file for the transmittal. Now you're going to see this note because basically since we have districts that are coming in you know, maybe they've already processed first, second quarter, but they came in into the redesign the third and fourth quarter of this year, okay? We don't have the first and second quarter information that needs to go on this CSV transmittal file for those two quarters. So that's why we have this note on here. When generating a Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania CSV transmittal file during the first year of converting to USPSR, Quarter amounts will need to be manually added to the generated file. A template file will be generated with placeholders to enter these values. Uh, Counts for 1099s will also have to be manually entered in the file. So basically, there is going to be a little bit of manual work to have to be done for that first year for anybody that's going to be submitting Pennsylvania taxes. Um, another thing, too, you'll notice on this page here, I do have the link for all the general information for Pennsylvania taxes. So if the district wants to go out and look at that information and read it about it, they can actually go in there and click, and click on that link and actually pull up all the information pertaining to that uh, Pennsylvania taxes. Does anybody have any questions on that? I know it's kind of a pain for the first year um, if, you, if you do have city or districts that are going to be reporting, but again, in order to get the data correct, you have to basically do that to that CSV file. And then once the district has the, the, the submission file and the transmittal file, both of those files can actually be uploaded by the district to the Pennsylvania website. It's, uh, it's called eTides, and they're going to actually go in and they can actually load that information right in there. They don't have to send it to you as the ITC. The district can actually load it on their own. Um, go down here. We just talked about all this. Okay. Another change for 2019, and actually, I just found out about this a day, a day and a half ago. The uh, Department of Taxation for Ohio is going to now require any districts that have, I think it's 250 or more W-2s, to submit that data 
online. So what that means basically is you as the ITC are going to be using that EFW2 file that gets created when you're processing W2 tape, the tape, W2 master, tape master. You're going to be uploading that file to the state of Ohio. Now, there's a couple little catches, not catches, but things with that because in the past, you've always created a W2 master tape file and you've uploaded that to the SSA and then always have burnt that to a disk and sent that to the state of Ohio the way it was in, that, in the format it was. Now, one thing to know that the state of Ohio wants that file to be called, be, have a text extension on it. So what I would suggest you do is you're going to have the W2 master tape sequential file created. Okay, you're going to have that created for your SSA submission. I would copy that and then go out and change the extension from an SEQ to a TXT because that's what they're going to be requiring for you to load for your districts. Now, um, question, there are, if you have questions, they, again, this is pretty new and they've just pretty much put all this information out there. One nice thing to know is when you're submitting this online, you will no longer be required to submit the Ohio IT3 forms. So if you, as the ITC used to have the district do it, and you're submitting them online now, they don't have to submit those IT3 forms anymore. If you as the ITC submitted the IT3 forms right with the tape or the, the disk that you sent in, you no longer have to submit IT3 forms for those districts. Um, in the following week, it basically said there's gonna be more information put out um, on the, the website, the Ohio uh, tax.gov website regarding employer withholding taxes. So I put the link on there for that website because there's gonna be a tutorial talking about like a step-by-step -step guide, how to actually go in and upload uh, through their website. It's gonna be the Ohio Business Gateway. That's how you're going to be loading that data. And then you'll also see here that there are some frequently asked questions because the first thing that came to my mind, and it was the first frequently asked question when I saw it on here is, okay, we as ITCs used to go in and we submitted data for like multiple districts. We aren't just submitting it for one. We have like multiple districts on this file. Is that gonna be a, allowed, okay? Here's your answer, yes. There is no need to produce individual W-2 files. The OBG W-2 upload feature accepts files containing multiple clients. Uh, the information, is, uh, W-2 information was in the same file, so yes. And the files, they cannot exceed 50 bytes, megabytes. So if, you're just, if your file is going to be bigger than that, you're probably going to have to put it in as a zip file and upload it as a zip file, just so you know that. And then here's some more frequently asked questions um, that people had asked in the previous years. Uh, it only required uh, employers uh, who issue 250 or more to submit the W-2 files. So again, for this tax year, anybody that has less than 250 is not gonna change. So if you have districts that are less than 250 and, they, and you don't wanna submit it on the electronic, you can, but I'm pretty sure that you're gonna do all or none would be my guess for your uh, the submission. But that's up to you how you wanna do it. Um, uh, there was another question about 1099 hours or 1099 hours through the W-2 upload feature on OBG, and it said at that time, at this time, that uh, 1099 hour information isn't accepted. Um, hey, Lori. Yes. Um, this is Nancy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How many how many ITCs have an account with the Ohio Business Gateway? Because we don't. Yeah, that's a good question, and no. that's something that might have to be done. You may have to go out and get an account set up in order to be able to go on to the Ohio Business Gateway and do it. Um, so you may want to start checking into that now, because obviously, you know, any district that ha they they may they probably have an account, but ITCs may not. 
So if that's the case, I'm assuming you should be able to go out and get an account created. Um, but I would probably start working on getting that done right now. That way you can electronically submit all of your districts and that makes it a little bit easier. I don't know if you've ever looked at that, but it's a nightmare. <laughs> I've been, believe me, I've been on there. I go on there every other week and yeah, it is a nightmare. You are right. <laughs> But don't you have to associate your account with each school or something, or do we not? I guess do we have any instructions on how, what kind of a, how we get an account to do it? We don't. And my guess is, Nancy, if you go out to the the Tax Ohio Gov, it, it, there's probably somewhere out there that gives you instructions on what needs to be done to create an account or to have an account set up. That's my guess. There's got to okay. be there's got to be documentation or instructions out there how you can do it or a phone number that you can contact in order to get an account set up. So, do you guys have one yet or not yet? I I don't. Nawaka I'm assuming does not. I'm assuming that they do not. I know in the past we didn't have one, and unless something has changed from last year to this year, they probably don't but one would have to be uh, created as well for, for Nawaka. Okay. So, okay. yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> Just something else you have to do. <laughs> but right. I guess the, the, the only good thing about it is once it's done, you have it, and then every year it'll, it'll be out there and you can, all you have to do is go out and do your submission for the tape file, so. But I mean, right. this initial year, it's gonna be kind of a hassle because you have to go out and actually get an account created on the Ohio Business Gateway, so. Okay. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and then just so you know, it, the just like in the past, the Department of uh, Taxation for Ohio, it does uh, follow the EFW-2 uh, layout. So that file that you're creating when you run that W-2 master tape file, is going to be in the correct format for the submission that they're wanting online. Um, and again, uh, we talked about if, it's, if your file is bigger uh, than 50 megabytes, or I have five, but um, you, you're gonna wanna go ahead and, and put that in a zip file, and don't password protect the zip file. They, they ask you not to do that. And then again, this is due by January 31st as well, just like your SSA file is. Lori, um, this is Mary Atlaka. We have another question. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we're um, not a COG, so everything that we file is filed under our fiscal agent's uh, IRN. Uh, would we have to file this under CTEX Business Gateway account? And then is there issues with all of the other district information being, uh, for all of the other districts being filed with that? I don't or, think um, I don't think there'll be a problem with it, Mary, because it sounds like, like it said, you could you can submit multiple records. So I mean that would be all of your districts that you're submitting. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, like I said, I really haven't found out a whole lot of information. I just got this email like literally a day and a half ago, and so as far as like you're like you you said your submission, you, you're probably, if you're, are you, did you say you're the CCOG or you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're We are the, not, we're in the process and, but that won't be done till um, July. But uh, right now we have fiscal agent and our, uh, when we do the W-2 mass right now, we're putting in our fiscal agent's um, IRN in okay. everything, or not okay. IRN, EIN in everything. Uh -huh. Right. And so that's why we didn't know if we could get our own account or if we would have to submit it through um, our fiscal agent's account. Yeah, that's a good question. That's something you're probably going to have to talk to the state of Ohio about because I don't know the answer to that. I, I really don't know that. And that, that's something that they're probably going to have to tell you. Because I know what you're saying, like in the past, um, I always use Nawaka's like EIN and uh, the numbers for Nawaka, but when I um, created the file, you know, it contained all school districts that we that we serviced. But it was we just I just used 
Nawaka's information. So my guess is, this is my guess, like with Nawaka, they're going to have to create, they're going to have to get a, an uh, online account created for, on OBT. But like you said, if you're using your fiscal agents and do they already have a, an online account? And are you to submit it through that? I, that I, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to that. So, and like I said, it does it did say within the coming weeks there'll be more information because there's not a whole lot of information right now, but we may find out more or we may just have to directly contact them and ask them those kind of questions because they should be able to, to tell us what needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I really couldn't give you much information on that. Well, I know there's not very many um, fiscal agent ITCs left out there, and um, but this is how we've always done it, and right. um, th this right. will be our last year submitting this way because we are uh, changing to a COG, or right. it's, at least it's in process. So um, that's where our yeah. question came from. Yeah, and I totally understand. I, I get your question for sure, but um, again, we may have to talk to the state of Ohio and ask them that kind of a question because they might say, oh, no, well, you should do it this way or you should do it that way or when you switch over and you're the COG, then you need to have your own account. You know, I, I don't know what the answer to that would be, but I will, I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye too, Mary, and if I see, you know, any more information throw, come through, I'll definitely relay it to you as I get it. So, Thank you. No problem. Okay, um, the changes for 2020, uh, there's going to be changes made to the W-4 for 2020. So the new W-4 does not have to be resubmitted for employees that already have a W-4 on file unless the employee that's already there and has a W-4 on file creates a new W-4. Um, the new W-4 is going to be used for basically anybody that's newly hired or anyone that changes or updates their W-4. So maybe you have an employee currently and they want to submit a new W-4 because they had a life change. Maybe they had a baby or they got married or something like that. That's when they're going to have to basically go in and fill out a new W-4. But if they, if they didn't have any life change, they could just leave their old W-4 the same as it was. Um, the changes on the, the, the new W-4 are going to impact the look of the federal tax record. So the, rate, the way that the payroll item for the federal tax looks is going to be changing on the redesign. Unfortunately, I don't have what that's going to look like because they have not gotten that completed yet. Our, our programmers are frantically working on it, but it's not done. It will, again, be done before uh, W-2 processing starts. But um, today I'll just kind of at least talk to you about what um, additions are going to be included on there and what I'm thinking, what we're kind of thinking is that we're, it's probably going to be, let me pull up the, uh, let me pull up the federal record and I'll show you where, this is just speculation, but I'm thinking that it's probably, this is probably where it's going to be. But I will, uh, don't, don't count that as mark it in stone because this is only my speculation, <laughs> which is very uh, not, not real popular or, or you looked at by, by our programmers. So it's very possible it could, be, it could be different, but I will show you where I think it's going to be at on this payroll item screen for the federal record. Maybe. Okay. Sorry, payroll items is a little bit slow because there's so much data that's getting pulled in. But once it gets pulled up, then we'll look at the federal record. Okay, here we go. So I'll just go ahead and pull up this federal record here. Let 
Okay, my thinking is, since there's gonna be new fields added, and there's really not a whole lot of space, my thinking is, is probably they're all gonna be over in this area by marital status. That's my thinking, is where those new fields will probably be located because there's really nowhere else on the record that they could put a whole lot. But that's my guess. That's where I'm thinking is going to be added. So um, what these changes are going to do is going to impact the way the taxes are calculated based on what is put on that W-4 information and what is actually populated on the federal record. So let me go ahead and pull up the next screen. So if the district is, or if district, if the employee is using a new W-4, so again, if it's a new employee, they're using a new W-4, um, there's going to be a field on here that says use new W-4. It's auto, that field is automatically going to be defaulted to no because, like I said, everybody that currently has a W-4 out there is not changing W-4, so we're just going to default that record to no. So anyone new or that has changed is going to have to have that field marked as a Y, a yes. Okay, the marital status um, is defaulted to blank for the existing record. Uh, that's going to determine the standard deduction and tax rates used to uh, compute the withholding. Oops, ah, skim things. All right, then there's going to be another field. It's called the two like jobs. All right, the two like jobs, and I'm gonna explain this to you, kind of. Um, it's gonna be defaulted to blank for existing records. So, but if more than one job at the same time, or if they're married, filing joint, and the spouse works, they may wanna check the box if there's only two jobs in the household. Uh, the standard deduction tax brackets will divide equally between the two jobs. So again, on the W-4, when you look at, if you go out, and I actually put a draft of the W-4 out there on our wiki page on the calendar year-end stuff, um, it actually has a draft of it, and there is a worksheet, like on the second page of the draft, and it talks about like the multiple jobs. So, you know, they, they have them complete the steps, you know, if there's more than one job, if they're married, filing joint, if the spouse works, all that information, and then there's different, um, fields, like field A is use the estimator on uh, the IRS.gov page. If uh, they want to use the multiple jobs worksheet on page three, there's all kinds of things that they can use to actually pull the data in to get the information for that particular field. Um, the depend, which is going to be another new field, is going to be for dependents, like the dependent amount. So it's going to, again, be defaulted to zero for existing records, but for any new or changed record, W-4s, on the federal record in that field, they're gonna take um, and multiply the number of children that they have under 17 times 2,000. That's gonna be their dependent amount. They're also going to multiply the number of other dependents, so maybe they have children over 17, or maybe they have a parent or an adopted child, something like that, that is a dependent. They're going to take that amount, the number, times 500, and that amount is going to be added. So they may be taking the, the uh, dependents over under under 17 multiplying by 2,000 plus they could have dependents uh, over 17 and, and multiplying that by 500 and totaling that together that's going to be the amount they're going to put on that depend field on that federal record. Um, then there is another one it's called income and that field again will be defaulted for existing records. But um, in that field, they could put in like the total of other estimated income for the year. They don't want to use income from other jobs, but again, on the draft of the W-4, there's a step four on a worksheet that talks about other income. 
So it could be like uh, interest payments, dividend payments, retirement income, anything like that. That would be considered other income. So they may be entering that, putting that information on the W-4. That stuff is going to be entered in on the, on the federal record as well, on the 001 record. Uh, another thing too they talk about here, itemized deductions. Oh, I'm sorry, we're talking about deductions. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now we're going to talk about deductions. Um, the deduction amount is, again, defaulted for existing records. And then they're going to use step five on the W-2 or W-4 worksheet to determine their number of dependents. Um, if, and then if they expect to claim deductions other than the basic standard deduction on the 2020 tax uh, return, uh, and they want to reduce the withholding by those deductions, they can do that as well. So that could possibly include itemized deductions, maybe like uh, uh, interest on your home or student loan interest or IRAs. So that information is going to be put in that deduct field. And then last but not least, the additional withholding, which we already have that out there. So it's already defaulted, you know, whatever it is. Uh, if an employee has, they want additional withholding withheld, we already have that out there. And again, there's a, a space on the W-4 that employees can put that information as well. So if that's the case and they want, you know, $25 more withheld out of their check, uh, the district on the federal record is going to put $25 in the additional withholding field for that record on the federal record. And again, here's kind of like a screenshot of that federal record where I, where I think that they're going to be putting those new fields in that area. But again, don't mark that in stone because I don't know if that's true or not. Does anybody have any questions about that? I know there's a lot of information, a lot of new stuff for the W-4 and then the, the federal record, the O-1 record is going to have all that, uh, those new fields on it as well. Lori, this is Mary Atlanta. I just have one question um, on um, marital filing status. Uh, you said this will be defaulted to blank for existing records. That is already on the field. Why is that going to be defaulted to blank rather than left as what is the, already Well, I on think um, blank for That's a good question. Hold on one C. Let me look at my document here. This will determine the standard deduction. Um, I, Mary, I'm thinking that that is not true. I'm thinking that the marital status, if they already have something out there, it's going to remain, and then it'll just be blank, obviously, for, for any new records they're creating, and they have to actually populate that field. I'll double check with our programmer on that, because it shouldn't blank it out for anybody already existing. It should already be on there. So let me, let me double check that with the programmer just to verify that, because I took all of this right off of the uh, impact statement that she had out there, but maybe it was incorrect. So I will, I will uh, check on that, and I will send a message out to everybody and tell them just to make sure on that, okay? Hey, Lori? Yeah. Um, if they fill in something for that depend field, will they still be filling in the number of exemptions as well? No, no. They're actually, I think they're, they're doing that off of that, uh, that, uh, check with that document, the W-4 draft document, because it has a worksheet, and so they're actually going to be going on that worksheet, and they're going to be figuring out, you know, like the number of dependents times 2,000, the number of dependents times 500, and then I think the amount from those figures is going to be what's going on that depend field. If they fill in the number of exemptions, will it be ignored if they have something in depend good or? question because I don't know uh, no not for no not for your new W4s because the the old you know the number of exemptions on the old I'm thinking will remain 
Mm-hmm. But anything on the new for the depend, they're going to have to put the dollar amount. Hold on, let me look at this step right here and tell you real quick. Yeah, because you're actually entering a dollar amount in there, Bonnie, on that depend field. You're using that uh, that list, that checklist, or that worksheet to yeah. calculate out the amounts, but you're actually going to be putting a dollar amount on there. Okay, but if they so, accidentally do both, will it cause a problem? Um, you know what, because that, this one says the same thing, it's going to default to zero for existing records. Um, let me check into that further. So I got to check into the depend and the deduct, right? Was that the other one that you asked me about, Mary? That's filing status. Filing status, oh my gosh, okay. Okay, let me check into both of those with the programmer and double check on that and make sure. I don't want to tell you something incorrectly, but obviously once we get the fields out there on the, on the screens, it'll probably help us a little bit too so you can see them. <laughs> because right now, we're, you know, you're kind of looking at it blindly, but yeah, I will double check on that as well as the filing status, Bonnie, and then I will send you guys all a message and tell you what I find out, okay? Anything else? Any other questions? Um, if not, I think we're done. And I will also keep, an, like I said, I'll keep an eye um, on the Ohio uh, taxes as far as like if there's any updates. And like I said, you may want to check into the Ohio Business Gateway because if you're going to be submitting that stuff online, you're going to probably have to have an account. So, but I will keep an eye out for that as well and let you know if I see anything, any updates or anything. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. Any more questions? All right, I will uh, check into these other two things and, and verify that with the programmer. I'll send a message out and let everybody know. And I think that's all I have. And everybody have a great weekend and thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you later.